good evening everyone uh, it is indeed a proud privilege to host this uh, very important non covid art webinar this is going to be the first of our uh, technical series uh, academic activities by the iags and i am in fact very happy to host this program for you uh, thank you all the leaders of the iags for uh, joining us we i am sharing the program for the day so warm welcome from the iags and this is going to be a program which is going to uh, discuss about the surgeons performing endoscopy why how and when so this is going to be a virtual technical update and we uh, discuss both the uh, training you. issues and everyone and uh, we are going to talk about the expert panel on technical issues as well so the program agenda will be Uh, we will have the inaugural address by uh, our president then we have four technical lectures by various leaders across the country then we have an expert panel again uh, across the country to discuss about uh, various issues so may I now request uh, our uh, president sir uh, dr raman goel to formally inaugurate the program uh good evening friends it's a proud privilege to be a part of this first of the technical uh, lecture series Uh, IAGS, as you know, is an academic body of almost eight thousand surgeons, and IAGS had been conducting lot of lot of uh, uh, activities for uh, re-certification re of surgeons, like fellowship courses and training programs and basic programs like knotting and suturing programs for almost twenty-seven years now. And this is because of the confidence that surgeons have placed in this body. that this has grown the only democratically elected uh, leadership uh, along among all the minimal access surgery groups in the country uh, once the covid hit our country we quickly decided that we will change ourselves into a service organization and we started providing service to our friends physicians nurses and uh, uh, ward assistants through a iags covid task force which is headed by our trustee dr subhash khanna who is also part of the panel today and through that we have supported medical colleges and uh, and the government hospitals across the country we have been able to ra raise a large corpus and we are expecting that by the time this covid is over we will be distributing somewhere around 1 crore rupees of uh, of uh, ppes and other 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 equipment like even body bags to and these are all going to government hospitals where we were directly fighting the the covid battle so this was this was one activity and we were the first to start the the covid webinars as early as 3rd of april we held the first webinar and we held 10 uh, webinars and and finished them somewhere around 3rd of may now after that we realized that there is a need for sharing this this Uh, digital platforms are great to spread uh, education and academic start academic activities so what we are doing is that we are we have developed all online courses so uh, most of you know about fiags we, we our uh, fiags is going to start online by the end of june then endoscopic F efiags is starting around somewhere around 15th of june and the advanced laparoscopic surgery programs the falls will start somewhere about 15th of july so this is the schedule the lectures are being recorded and this will be a one of its kind training program which will be like a hybrid pro program so we will have the the didactic lectures through the online program and hands on uh, training will be given before the uh, national conference which will be in coimbatore this year Uh, with the dr ishwar murthy who is secretary of iags and also organizing secretary of the national conference in coimbatore so i think this will give enough training program and the the examination and viva as it is done will be done at coimbatore uh, for the participants so i think all those surgeons who are today uh, joined this webinar can make a note of it and can reach out to any one of us i am i am privileged to have a team of very dedicated very dynamic uh, people around me and that that is uh, who are helping uh, me 
uh, pushing me to to increase more, have more and more activities and also the advantage of being uh, a president of iags is that i have support of so many senior academicians across the country like professor krishna rao who is our uh, uh, very senior advisor dr g v rao uh, who does so many uh, gi work and and other people from around the country so i think uh, we 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 are part of this and this kind of uh, technical series that we are starting dr kanagwel mentioned is this is the first one uh, from next week every sunday we will have a master class on something very basic so we will have a master class on gallbladder disease which will be a 3 hour master class on next sunday and every sunday there will be a master class on a basic surgical procedure or basic endoscopic procedure which will be 3 hour class from a to z discussion and question answers besides that we are also starting a series of international uh, programs international you can call it a conference of about 4 hours every week on a advanced topic so the first one will be on a colorectal surgeon and where we will have surgeons from across the world and this will be on a working day in the in the evening between 4 to 8 so the idea is that you as you are at home uh, you get to have this information uh, i do not foresee the lockdown getting much eased out in next few months so i i believe uh, uh, we will have time at hand all of us will have time at hand and it's a good opportunity to learn of course you must remain healthy and safe which is the basic requirement and the biggest safety is by social distancing and and by hand hygiene uh, that message must go in every activity that we do in life because every time one person takes it more seriously one life is saved on that day so i think with this uh, i i uh, wish to close my address and i want dr kanagwe to start this program thank you sir thank you for your uh, inaugural address and thank you for sharing the information what are the programs proposed for uh, iags now we move on to the next agenda uh, may i now request uh, dr govind raj vice president of the south zone of the iags to start is uh, govind raj sir is uh, the chairman of the gvn group of hospitals trichrapalli and uh, he is the one who has been uh, mentored by dr krishna rao to words endoscopy and in fact uh, before the systematic courses came he already had many courses running on single team conferences almost every year and uh, we request uh, dr govind raj to share his views why surgeon should uh, do endoscopy govind raj sir over to you you can start thank you. sharing now thank you thank you um, kanagvel Uh, it is so nice to see everybody in this uh, platform it's wonderful and first uh, all my uh, uh, i should say my thanks to my guru my mentor my guide professor bkr sir who is also in this today in the same platform and to the senior uh, endoscopists of the country professor gv rao and all my fellow uh, ec members of the iags and of course the president and the secretary um this is a wonderful uh, platform uh, in which uh, we are talking today and the purpose of this talk is uh, why surgeons should do endoscopy and uh, if i am to be asked uh, why surgeons should not do endoscopy that is the way it should be the question should be because the endoscopy started with the surgeons and i still feel it is still continuing with the surgeons of course it is not we are competing with somebody for the endoscopy it is almost a hand in glove or a in synchrony we both work with endoscopy with all the other departments which are doing endoscopy also and these are the few salient points which i thought should be told why surgeon should be doing endoscopy the most commonly all the surgical procedures treatment are basically done by surgeons and uh, so i feel that still surgeons should be the person who should be initiating the art of the endoscopy particularly for the diagnosis or for the treatment part whichever it is so surgeons have a right to do endoscopy in this way and they help in better understanding of the disease and the treatment because uh, you are more practically involved within inside from inside this uh, the patient so i feel that surgeons definitely understand the disease more 
and when they are doing that endoscopy and particularly when they are treating the patient it is more useful for them if they have done the endoscopy and uh, as you learn through the, your uh, surgical uh, curriculum and uh, anatomy is the most important thing which a surgeon should be knowing so basically when endoscopy is going to be taught you know the anatomy very well and i have seen for that itself when a surgeon does an um, endoscopy or therapeutic procedure how confident he is and how fearlessness that is the most important thing i see fearlessness towards blood and this if anyone had been to most of the any of the the uh, live workshops you can see how fearless a, when a surgeon does an endoscopy and uh, how it, it is towards the the blood he looks at the blood because almost day in and day out he has been handling blood and uh, when the blood is magnified in the endoscopic image probably it is magnified more than 10 times it gives a kind of an alarming kind of a phobia most of for most of the people but i don't feel any of the surgeons have that phobic uh, idea towards the blood and technically i feel most of the surgeons being doing the same procedure which they have done surgically either an open or a laparoscopy it is easy for them to convert into an endoscopic method rather than it is for a different person who has never done it either open or laparoscopically and most of the time most of the time even though now the endoscopy is very much advancing most of the time any complication that happens in endoscopy is being treated by a surgeon so surgeon has a very good right to do the endoscopy himself and these are the few salient features we have to add here because it might be a repetition i just want to touch through it because professor bk sir is going to talk on the history of endoscopy these are three periods of endoscopy the rigid period the semi flexible period and the fiber optic period these are the three periods if you look into these three periods from the development of the endoscopy in all these three periods surgeons have been the important people in developing the endoscopy these are the surgeons who have been in the evolution of endoscopy to name a few like uh, philip bossini i think uh, he is the called the father of the world endoscopy because he is a urologist who developed the first uh, design of an endoscope and kusmal he is another surgeon who removed a foreign body and uh, i think if anybody knows an endoscopy fiber optic he cannot uh, forget uh, basil hishropich he is a south african surgeon who moved to us later and he developed the endoscopy and in that way if you are going to talk about uh, professor nitz uh, he was one of the important persons in uh, who developed the art of rigid endoscopy for urology and uh, particularly the ercp was developed by mcune in 1968 he was another surgeon and in today's era what in the era in which we live and in which we have professor bkr we are very proud to say nip sohendra who is an indonesian surgeon who moved from indonesia to germany he is uh, one of the called the fathers of uh, ERCP he developed a lot of things in ERCP and of course he is one of the pioneering experts who developed this sclerosing agents for the bleeding gastric ulcers and uh, professor BK arrives now when i used to hear from him because how he and uh, professor nip sohendra used to work in hamburg in the early uh, 70s and the late 60s that's what he used to tell to me when he was telling about and that's the time and he sowed the seeds of endoscopy into me and uh, these are the surgeons few people very important in the history or particularly who did the first peg uh, and that was gardner and uh, suppose the colonic uh, polypectomy that was shinya from japan and sems nowadays sems tends at completely revolutionized the art of endoscopy this was initially done by a japanese surgeon itabashi and uh, these are the milestones in the evolution of endoscopy which have been contributed by surgeons and here i have to mention after mentioning all these our own father of modern endoscopy is professor bk and he used to tell to me when he came late 60s to india there are people who are criticizing him that he was doing something with a rice tube and that's how he started the art of endoscopy in india and today he is among with us to tell how from his own mouth how he had developed the art of endoscopy in india and when this endoscopy is being so critical in a surgical practice surgeons they perform endoscopy both pre operatively intraoperatively and post operatively for example pre operatively it is very useful for the diagnosis for the planning of the surgery and nutritional support 
And here the second point is very important because planning of surgery, particularly in colonic resections, and uh, there has been many times if the surgeon had done the endoscopy and uh, while doing a laparoscopic resection, there have been instances where the tumor has not been removed at all. And if it's a surgeon who has done the endoscopy and the tattooing has been done by him, you know as well that which part is the exact part where the tumor is and there is more chance that, that any, uh, any missing of the lesion can never happen. So definitely planning of the surgery, endoscopy is very important. And of course, nowadays more importance given for the nutritional support. Nutritional support is come very long way now from the days when we talk about the uh, parental nutritional support, it is more about the enteral nutritional support. When it comes to, when you talk about the enteral nutritional support, definitely endoscopy plays a major role, whether you are going to place just an esogastric tube or you're going to put a, an, a peg, whatever it is, endoscopy plays an important role in adding to the nutritional support of the patient, preparing him for the patient, either preoperatively or postoperatively. Intraoperatively, and this is the one which I said, to localize the lesion and aiding in surgery. And now uh, there are a lot of hybrid surgeries are, which are coming up. If you are a laparoscopic surgeon and if you want to do a basic of endoscopy, but you don't have the real, uh, the knack of doing highly advanced therapeutic endoscopy, you can do hybrid where you can do a laparoscopy and an endoscopy. You can, for example, CALP. CALP is a colonoscopic assisted uh, 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 colonic resections, where laparoscopic resection is being aided by and uh, laparoscopy and colonoscopy. If you have a right-sided uh, lesion in the colon, where you can put a colonoscope, you can do a colonic uh, resection of the uh, of the entire tumor with the help of the laparoscopy also. This is called the CALP there, or which is called the hybrid surgery. And uh, this way, there are a lot of hybrid surgeries which are evolving now. For example, if you have a lesion just in the stomach, you can put an endoscope, uh, and at the same time, you can put a laparoscope, and then you can completely remove this just with the help of an endoscope. If you are not confident to do a full thickness resection, your laparoscope can. So what I mean to say is, even if you are not a very highly sophisticated endoscopy, endoscopist, with the help of a laparoscopy, you can do a hybrid procedure, you can complete the procedure. So definitely intraoperatively, for, particularly for laparoscopic surgeon, endoscopy is definitely useful to make a, an average endoscopist into a highly developed and uh, lapro endoscopist. And particularly during when you do one bariatric surgery or any reconstructive surgery or an esophageal myotomy, endoscopy is done peroperatively to check for leaks. And this has been very useful nowadays to check the leak endoscopically immediately during the procedure itself. And uh, coming to the post-operative period, this is where endoscopy has completely revolutionized the post-operative complications of majors and the newer advances of surgery, particularly the bariatric surgery. The gastric or esophageal resection when you have done, you need to do a surveillance endoscopy. That is where the post-op endoscopy comes. But that doesn't come immediate post-op. You have time uh, stage managed to do one post-operative endoscopy for surveillance. At the same time, for a pre-malignant lesion, you have done an endoscopic resection. You need to do a post-operative endoscopy to check on the surveillance or the endoscopy, whether the lesion is recurring or not. And the third point is the most important point, which I'm saying now is particularly in bariatric leak or major surgical resections where you've done an anastomotic, yeah, anastomosis, that is laparoscopic anastomosis has done, and you develop a leak in the post-operative period. If you know the art of placing a stent or if you know the art of endoscopic suturing, then your life is so easy because there have been mortality which has been reduced after this endoscopic stenting has come into vogue now. And particularly the bariatric surgery when we started in 2001 and before that, the mortality in the post-operative leak was almost more than 50 to 60 percent. That has been reduced because of this endoscopic stenting in the post-operative period from 50 to 60 percent to almost less than 10 percent. This is a wonderful achievement which has been helped by endoscopy. Definitely, if you are a surgeon who has done the surgery and if you are able to do the same endoscopic stenting, that ends the story. At all. And now, I am coming to a few of the last slides because this is the now in thing now in the art of endoscopy, third space endoscopy. What do you mean by third space endoscopy? 
the first space is the lumen the second space is the peritoneal space and of course the third space or the submucosal space is the third space endoscopy from open surgeries you have traveled to laparoscopic surgery which has been little bit transformed into robotic surgery from robotic surgery now we have come to the third space endoscopy and i think uh, professor g v will be elaborating on the third space endoscopy it has completely revolutionized in the way in which you have been handling most of the upper gi uh, symptoms uh, by doing a third space endoscopy particularly the poem which found a way into the third space endoscopy has revolutionized and now i think most of the lesions are now being done in the third space endoscopy particularly for the esophagus which are not benign lesions and for little bit part of the stomach which are benign lesions and third space endoscopy if you can master that art definitely that learning curve we are going to talk about the learning curve if you can master that art of the third space endoscopy you will become a full fledged surgeon where you do laparoscopy endoscopy and of course third space endoscopy and with this i try i will conclude with the last slide in that it is not the strongest of the species that survives not the most intelligent that survives it is the one that is more adaptable to change will is going to survive thank you so much and i should thank iags for starting this program thank you so much thank you dr govindraj sir uh, yep. there have been few questions coming up i think i will take the questions at the end of all the talks so that some overlap of questions are also there now uh, i take the privilege of uh, introducing our uh, secretary dr ishwar murthy sir ishwar murthy sir is our uh, dynamic uh, secretary sorry ishwar murthy sir is our dynamic secretary of the national iags and uh, he is an ardent uh, endoscopy trainer of trainers in fact uh, he has traveled across the country to impart uh, endoscopy education to surgeons and he runs and has run many fellowship programs and non fellowship endoscopy training programs he firmly believes endoscopy should be part of the surgeon's armamentarium and he has the mission to impart endoscopy education to the entire uh, surgical community and fraternity he is the chairman of the lotus hospital and he heads the minimally invasive surgery department as well in that hospital over to you ishwar sir uh, you can uh, start sharing your powerpoint please unmute ishwar murthy sir please yes sir we are able to see your screen sir please start can you hear me very well sir please go ahead thank you kana hevel well for your nice introduction respected president respected bkr sir gb and all my colleagues as my friend goindraj said i think we all should agree endoscopy training is essential for every surgeon that's what we have been doing for the last 20 years after my post graduation in surgery but we all understand in the last 20 years or so we don't know whether it is because of laparoscopy the surgeon actually not taking the path of endoscopy as frequently it is becoming less traveled path as far as the surgeon is concerned that is actual truth we have to admit that truth but we also should understand now if a patient is coming with a gi problem we have three solutions an endoscopy a laparoscopy and open surgery from the patient point of view the choice for the surgeon is one of these three things and the surgeon has every right to do or choose what is right for the patient see for example the commonest one of the condition like a, a pseudo pancreatic cyst is a large one requiring surgery cysto gastrostomy you decided 20 years ago we would have done nobody question it is an open cysto gastrostomy and more frequently in the last 10 years or so we do more and more cases laparoscopically and i'm sure gv and all the people advanced endoscopists and surgeons will agree now patient will be very much pleased if you can put a lumen opposing stent and drain this cyst collection or fluid collection endoscopically because this is obviously one with no incision because we all say laparoscopy a keyhole surgery because of small incision early return to normality but endoscopy even a one step ahead without an incision with a natural orifice surgery a transluminal surgery 
that's the advantage and obviously if you put the choices across to a patient population i am sure which one they are going to choose but as a surgeon we should be able to address the patient's problem in any of these three modality that is my request because not only that if you see in the last 5 years or so be it an achalasia grd or even the bct more and more endoscopy solutions are coming i think people are more comfortable doing a poem for achalasia and they are actually large series of 1000 2000 cases are appearing and also sleeve gastroplasty endoscopically done is trying to replace the conventional bariatric procedures so like that and the question when comes who is going to do all these things whether the surgeons are ready to take up this challenge so it is not only that we understood from what dr goindra said the surgeon has to do endoscopy and endoscopy not just diagnostic therapeutic how far you can go it all depends upon how much you can get trained yourself and who is there to train you so that's a challenge we have so i have in my questions asking myself three questions do we have a structured training of endoscopy which is a need of the hour for our people see for example for a surgeon ideally a yeah, long duration training like a 3 years is optimum during his post graduation either ms post graduate or surgical gastroenterology or can we go for a 3 months an intensive training or you can come for a weekend course on a focused training team based training like a gastroplasty and thing like that or doing a third space endoscopy like this so this is actually a need and there are lots of platforms available for surgeon to get access to all these things but equally important is to make sure we have to increase the pool of the trainers because what is lacking in indian scenario at least is a efficient energetic passionate trainer doing the endoscopy training day in and day out that platform in iags we are increasing the platform i am very very grateful for our presidents in the last few years giving us a free hand to improve the the platform so it is like a triangle at the basement so we are getting the base ready so that we can just lift ourselves not only we also improve our ourselves we also take along with us the youngsters doing and more and more procedures and the very important thing all of us should know go slow go systematic step wise approach to training endoscopy you train yourself diagnostic how far you can go in endotherapy that's a question and that's a challenge i'll put that question in the panel see for example the importance of endoscopy training is understood by all the surgeons across the globe sages recognized it decades ago that's why this brought out this program an excellent program a flexible endoscopy surgery program fest and an american college of gastroenterology the surgeons actually during the residency they have to do this program in order to become a board certified surgeon see that become a requisite same way even in uk if you see higher surgical training even though they have to satisfy a minimum number of cases they have to do the jack the joint advisory group in j endoscopy in uk actually oversees all the surgeons doing the higher surgical training similarly even though here it's like anything i mean mci is giving you a broad based guidelines and there are departments with endoscopy provisions like endoscopy colonoscopy in most of the district hospitals but still with a lack of a uh, structured approach and with a lack of the passionate teachers there is a lacune we have to address that especially some packets in india especially in northern country and western zone we have understood from our colleague the teaching is very little for the surgeons as far as the endoscopy is concerned they are only the iags has taken it thanks to ramesh agarwal i think during that time he actually given me the green signal and sand dave and subhas kanna now raman goel i'm sure sunil popat all our surgeons and they are all inclined that for us to go ahead like what the sages had done passionately we start teaching not only the basic but also advanced so we have in our setup as you all know efags which is a basic endoscopy fellowship course and an advanced fellowship that is fag and all of us should know it is not the quantity of the endoscopy it is not technical skill you do about 100 upper gi endoscopy you can master it it is not just like that because of the cognitive skill because the endoscopy is no longer it is an art it has become a science image enhancement technique and image again see if you see a lesion the surgeon or whoever is seeing is able to recognize the lesion 
and able to say it is early cancer and what treatment it needs and is able to communicate to the patient and he is able to perform the procedure without producing any complication if there is a complication he is able to recognize early and is able to reach out to the senior in order to rectify the problem so it is not just uh, just doing like reaching the d1 or reaching the cecum it is not it is a technical problem but it's a cognitive skill that's where the structured training gives and we have a, a systematic modules developed over a period of hard work and actually supervised by our professor krishna rao sir has meticulously has gone through the module several times now it has become like a well oiled machine is going on 30 lecture modules when to do when not to do what sedation to give what is the indication when you see a patient what to do all the step wise we have all the things not only that we have a very good assessment module also with mcq practicals and everything has been going on but of course the covid has given a little jerk in our training program but as you all know there are lots of modules it is not you have a patient in the couch you do a live case and the resident or your trainee is just seeing is doing it it is a live human that is not always possible in the present era we have to use the dry lab wet lab and the animal lab various avenues are there to get the training so that's we have to use it effectively and whenever i do a contact the program i know the surgeon because of his good hand eye and foot coordination because i have done a training of surgeons physicians even non surgeons people in ima asi various platforms you have done and i can tell you with my in my heart it comes from my heart that i can train every surgeon in the shortest span of time i can't quantitate but it is possible because the surgeons understand easy understanding the anatomy and his good knowledge of the background ga disorder and his uh, ability to see everything through the ct scan through the uh, laparoscopy endoscopy is an extended skill of laparoscopy so it's very very easy and also there are lots of simulation like uh, this simulation for upper gi scope and also for the colonoscopy we have a simulation and thanks to uh, gani uh, and also gsl like that there are various i mean like gmast we have uh, in mumbai we have a virtual endoscopy platform marine if you spend about 10 hours or so you get so hands eye coordination becomes a habit and also there are lots of simulation of interventional procedures because i can't give the endoscopy when actually there is a bleeding is happening to my trainee so he has to have a simulation where he has to do 20 or 30 times to see what band to apply how to apply a band how to apply the suction when to release the suction what happens if the suction is released too soon all those technical things he learns in his hard way then only he goes to the real patient in other words you do every cases virtually 100 times before you do one case real time that is the word we are going to live and also for a hand i mean like a tactile feedback and also endo ultrasound ec animal model is a good thing we can rely on and also all this conventional wisdom like having the all the company people coming and teaching you how to disinfect maintain the scope in all everybody like a round table nothing like a ward rounds nothing like a round around like that so it gives the confidence to everybody yes i can do it i can teach my nurses and also you have to make sure the surgeons it is not the next case you will do every surgeon has to see at least about 100 cases he has to watch from behind the page shoulder or watch various videos in the youtube then allow them to assist like one portion just intubation alone today or up to the sigmoid colon today then transverse colon then reducing a loop like that then he reaches the cecum after a struggle of the 25 cases but i can say a person is confident to do a colonoscopy or endoscopy after a magic number usually the number revolves around 140 but i think for a surgeon i would say an upper gi endoscopy number in my opinion is around 25 and for sigmoidoscopy around 25 and for a colonoscopy around 50 i brought the number down because this is the minimum requirement for sages also even though the asg guideline gives you a higher number for a surgeon this is the minimum for credentialing to become a thing and as you say thanks to our president raman goel and all my colleagues here we are now able to start the our online course and as our president clearly explained it is going to start in matter of two weeks with the 30 modules the beauty of the modules are it's not like you have to travel and stay with us and uh, it is there on the platform ready 
you can be, see it in the day. If you are busy in the day, you can see it at 9 o'clock at night also. Flexibility of the time. But one month duration, you see all the modules under fellowship category. If you are a postgraduate, still you can take it as a non-fellowship category. And there are study materials like endoscopy book will be freely you can send to you by post courier. And I'm sure uh, with this modules, which are book, means, I mean, designed in such a way that you can learn to speak the language of every endoscopist you're going to see. All the masters you're going to see in this module, like Dr. Goindra, Satyapriya, Kandi Bhaskar Rao, Subhas Karnasa, Sunil Papa, everybody will be there to take each and every step and we are going to have several panel discussion. We are going to show you all the uh, live cases also, record and live, so that all the tricks of the trade you know. And if you have an access to endoscopy in your own unit, nearby unit, continue and maintain your logbook. And when you come to the conference, for example, that time, then we'll do an assessment, we'll demonstrate more cases, give you some hands-on experience also. This is the best we can do, especially with the current prevailing COVID situation. As I said, the teaching is a slightly different platform. We fast track the teaching. For example, when I say do endoscopy this patient, just don't take the endoscopy too. You do a cockpit drill. What Before starting the plane, what a pilot does. He do that. He is doing the equipment checklist. So there are six checklists. We teach them that way. Next, before you examine, what are the things you ask the patient? Don't waste your time. When a patient is going to be on the table, I should know as an endoscopist or a surgeon why I'm doing. And is there any contraindication? And is there any drug history? The patient is, is on warfarin as he stopped warfarin five days ago because I'm about to do a biopsy. As the patient signed a consent form, whether the patient is fasting, all these things, most of them you can delegate to your staff nurse if they're efficient enough. Otherwise, your junior more surgeon because checklists are important to avoid problems. And always there are three levels of training we see. Level one is what EFH is all about, doing a diagnostic upper endoscopy and colonoscopy, some basic therapeutic life-saving procedures like banding, simple dilatation, ulceration, so that once you are happy, once you have five to 10 years of experience, we can invite you for the 4G in another two years down the line. And then if you are so keen, fascinated, sir, my way of my bread, of, um, uh, bread and butter for my life is not laparoscopy, endoscopy, feel like me, then you can go for more advanced theme-based like ESD and EMR as a third step. So this is the way I advise. And everybody knows more you do, more confident you are becoming and the expert you become. So the numbers do matter. Practice, practice, practice. That is very, very important. But I should emphasize it is not the technical skill, the cognitive skill. That's where is a, uh, I mean, IAGS as EFH is online. We are going to help you. Methodological skill, communication skill, we are there. And it is not just giving you a certification. We are there as a panel for the rest of your life as a mentorship. So we are always approachable. Any legal problem, we can always approach. So we are there not only to acquire competence, we are also there to assess your competence, whether you're having met the minimum standard and to let you do a procedure. Like the sages, they have a way of assessing the competence. They do what we call a GAGES, that is a Global Assessment of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy Skill. And Jack, they do a different way, that is a direct observed performance score. That is, every surgeon has to demonstrate at least 10 cases under supervision that they are able to do confidently. Then really they are certified. IH is also, we have to be confident. So online alone may not be sufficient. So during the conference, like forthcoming conference, you will be asked to come a day or two beforehand. We'll be doing a live demonstration. We'll be having hands-on and we'll be assessing you also on MCQ practicals. Then only, I'm sure you're all will be, it is our job as a passionate teacher to make sure you are there, you are qualified to receive this well-coveted, this EFAGS when you come for our conference. Ladies and gentlemen, patient care, as far as the GA is concerned, it is not confining to one person. It is not surgeon alone. It is not the medical gastroenterologist or the general practitioner or the interventional. It is a collective. We should be complementary to each other, not competing with each other. That is the first thing we need to understand. The next important thing is endoscopy is going to be yet another tool for every one of you from today onwards. You do open surgery, laparoscopy, 
take it from me gv rav is there who has done the first notes procedure endoscopically like that endoscopy is going to be an answer for a lot of problem and you are there at the right time you get trained because i ask all of you take the less traveled path from today onwards because laparoscopy you everybody is traveling take the path there may be challenges but we are there as an iags to go along meet the challenges because the opportunities you are going to have in the future are plenty i am sure you have to grab the opportunity thank you very much thank you all everyone for patient listening thank you ishwar sir uh, for uh, giving a bird's eye view of what is planned what is required as a trainee as a surgeon and the initiatives being done and uh, being taken for the coming year going on a virtual platform and the changes being implemented in the newer modality of teaching so with that we move on to the next presentation our uh, president elect dr sunil papad from ahmedabad is going to address about endoscopic polypectomy sunil papad sir is a, a got his fcs and he has his own setup where he does endoscopy by himself he also very very well planned hospital specializing in minimally invasive surgery he has a passion towards foregut surgery and of course he also has hosted the iags national congress fags courses fals courses and he's been a ardent supporter of academics and he was the immediate past secretary of the iags where he has been instrumental in coordinating and uh, streamlining many of the iags activities on digital platform so with that introduction uh, i request our president elect dr sunil papad sir to talk his uh, start his talk on endoscopic polypectomy over to you sir we are able to see your slides please start can you please unmute yourself sir unmuted can you hear yes. me perfect yes. please start sir can you hear me now very well sir please start sir okay thank you kanagwell for a very nice introduction and thank you for organizing this wonderful webinar on this sunday afternoon i congratulate president dr raman goel for taking up this initiative and starting this master classes and mini conferences as a webinar on sunday afternoon i am very pleased to have my teachers professor bk rao professor jv rao all around here before 25 years i went to dr jv rao and dr nagi reddy to learn the advanced endoscopy and i am so happy to be here giving a talk when they are moderating thank you for allowing me to be here my topic for today is a endoscopic polypectomy mainly i will be concentrating on the colonoscopic polypectomy we heard two nice lectures from uh, govind raj and ishwar murthy why the surgeon should be doing it and how the training can be achieved and one of the therapeutic procedure is doing a polypectomy so all of you are aware regarding what is polyp the polyp can be sessile or pedunculated most likely it is found in colon but it can be in stomach or small intestine and it can be neoplastic or non neoplastic so polypectomy is basically a procedure which removes the polyp and there can be complication and side effects like any procedure in endoscopy or surgery the what is important is because we if this is being a therapeutic procedure we would prefer it to do under cons the conscious sedation we give propofol and some analgesics and the anesthetic is present and obviously you need to have ot setup to do this kind of advanced endoscopic procedure the position of the patient the position of the surgeon and the position of the scope these are all very important so position we start with the left lateral position of the patient however we can shift the patient into supine position if it is required if the polyp is situated in that kind of position the scope should always be steady and there should not be too much of torque when you are doing a colonoscopic polypectomy or any other therapeutic procedure and the surgeon should also be in a comfortable position surgeon should not be bending too much or he should not be twisting too much otherwise there will be problem 
the common accessories which are being used are the different kind of polypectomy snares the injection needles which are used for epinephrine and saline injection the retrieval basket endo clips endo loops etc the polyp should be placed in the position of the surgeon the preferably polyp should be placed at 5 or 6 o'clock position or any other comfortable position where the surgeon can see the polyp and the stock and go around it nicely change the patient position if required and keep polyp at a short distance from the tip of the endoscope we prefer to use submucosal epinephrine injection where we use a diluted epinephrine with a methylene blue and saline the needle is inserted we use a 23g needle for injection submucosal injection and we lift up the polyp then we use the snare to do the snaring so the advancement of the snare over the polyp using up and down control and torque as snare is slowly tightened aspirate extra air to reduce the colonic wall tension and maximize the tissue capture however do keep and maintain the lumen tenting of the polyp to direct diathermy away from the muscle layer and which will lessen the risk of the transmural burns so ensure safe tissue capture by moving the snare catheter back and forth and there should be free movement of the snare with the polyp inside if you are concerned that you have taken the muscularis propria then you release and recapture the polyp and after snaring aim to keep the polyp in the center of the lumen to limit the thermal destruction of the adjacent tissue once you have hold the polyp keep it in the center of the lumen so that you don't accidentally burn the colonic wall transaction should be controlled and it should not be a jerky transaction otherwise there are increased chances of bleeding and do not apply too much of cautery otherwise also there are more chances of cautery induced perforation so i'll show you a case of a colonoscopic polypectomy in a left colon this is a a polyp size of about 2 to 3 cm size you can see very red looking polyp and there is a long stalk the position of polyp is little difficult as there is a fold coming and just beyond the fold the polyp is lying so we inject in the stalk first of all we identify position the polyp and then we inject in the stalk and now with the snare we go all around the polyp and try to hold the stalk as near to the polyp as possible so we have gone around the polyp as you can see now we will shorten the snare so that it snugly fits the stalk now you can see it is snugly fitting the stalk and we are quite away from the colonic wall you can see nicely so once that is done see you can see we are quite away from the colonic wall once that is done we start doing the polypectomy we apply the blended cut current and do step by step cutting with coagulation and the polypectomy is complete and the stock is hold by the snare only so we can take out the snare and scope together and the polyp will come out if there is a problem in holding the polyp then we can use the rothmans basket to bring out the polyp so this is how the polyp has come out this is a another case another about 2.5 to 3 cm size polyp angry looking as you can see and there is a stalk but always spend time to look at the polyp and the stalk properly and then find out a proper place where you can keep the polyp in which position and then how to attack the polyp so the polyp is put in nice position and you can do this polypectomy without injection also but we have make it a, we have made it a protocol that we inject them all the time and then now we shorten the snare 
and then we bring it as near to the polyp as possible, as you can see. And again, we apply the current, the cautery, and gradually we cut the stalk, and as you can see, there is no bleeding. When the polyp is on the right side of the colon or in the ascending colon, this particular large polyp is situated at the ileocecal junction, as you can see. And it's a, about three to four centimeter size polyp. And it is situated just at the ileocecal junction. So we looked all around, we identified the stalk, which was a short stalk, and then injected at the stalk, and then go around the polyp. Very important here is to not to include the ileal lumen inside the snare, otherwise there are high chances of perforation. So once we go around, we maneuver the scope and the polyp in such a way so that we can see the short stalk and we apply the snare on the stalk only, which contains only mucosa. Then gradually we start doing the polypectomy. As we start cutting because of the reduced blood pressure, you will see that the polyp has become darker and more and more cyanosed. Gradually, we cut through the stalk, and in between, we move back and forth to ensure that there is no colonic wall involved. As you can see now, the, the polyp has turned almost blue. So the main musculature is already taken care of. It is important to have patience and not rush through the cutting, otherwise there are high chances of bleeding or perforation. And once that is done, you can see the base of the polyp where it was and it is nicely cut and there is no bleeding. Polyp when it is more than two centimeter size, there is increased chance of bleeding because of the vascularity, increased risk of perforation. It may take longer time to resect. When the polyp is covering more than one third of the circumference of the colonic wall, they are more difficult to remove endoscopically. So one needs to have proper training and proper technical skills and knowledge. When the polyps are behind the folds, they are difficult to resect due to their location. Injection of the far side of the polyp should be done first, followed by the near side. The snare may then be more easily placed and the retroflexion sometimes may be required. When the polyp is near the <laughs> it is difficult because the retroflexion of the scope may be required. In some cases, we may need to use a gastroscope. And because of the squamous epithelium is nearby, it may be more vascular and more sensitive, so patient may feel pain. So one has to be very careful when you are taking out a polyp just at the anorectal junction or at the lower end of the rectum. Also, in a periappendiceal polyps, they are quite rare, but they may extend through the appendicular orifice into the appendix. One has to be careful and examine properly. It, that mucosa, the periappendiceal mucosa, does not elevate well when you inject the submucosal injection. The involvement of greater than 50% of the appendiceal orificial circumference is a relative contraindication to endoscopic removal. Surgery is better and safer in that situation. When you have multiple polyps, it may be difficult to retry all the polyps and may be requiring multiple endoscopies. Location of each polyp may be critical if there may be advanced dysplasia is found. Accurate labeling is important for the site of the polyp. Removing polyps in the cecum first and followed by additional polypectomies in distal colon may increase the risk of cecal perforation. So one has to see first all the polyps and then plan the endoscopic polypectomy. If there are too many polyps, we may have to do in staging. What are the common complications? 
the bleeding is one of the most common complication the bleeding can occur immediately or it can be delayed it can be reactionary bleeding or it can be secondary bleeding immediate post polypectomy bleeding is recorded in up to 4% of the polypectomies it is more common with large pedunculated polyps or polyps in the rectum bleed more frequently during or after polypectomy due to increased vascular supply immediate bleeding more common when using cutting currents delayed bleeding more common with pure coagulation currents bleeding is more common after piecemeal resection or emr prevention of bleeding how can we prevent the bleeding the submucosal epinephrine injection is one option and very good option we can also use an endolope if there is a very vascular polyp with a long stock which i just showed you or you can use a clip placement but it is better to use endolope rather than clip clip is better for controlling the bleeding so once how to control the bleeding after polypectomy first and foremost is the hemoclips second is endolope if you have a bleeding stock or if it's a sessile area you can use the injection and some tamponade or you can use sometimes apc or even gold probe or coagulation for sep there is a situation called post polypectomy syndrome which is also known as transmural burn syndrome where the thermal energy administered during snare electrocoagulation extends into muscularis propria it causes necrosis of the muscle fiber and local peritonitis without full perforation it can occur in up to 2% of polypectomies and more frequent in ascending colon with excessive wear symptoms can be abdominal pain 1 to 4 days after polypectomy with or without fever leukocytosis and signs of peritonism most of these patients are re responding to the conservative treatment with antibiotic iv fluid and bowel rest but one has to make sure that there is no definite perforation if there is a perforation the risk of perforation is increased with flat or sessile polyps or the polyps in the ascending colon or and that's why blended cut is recommended over pure coagulation if it is a immediate perforation secondary to mechanical stress or barotrauma or as complication of electrosurgery technique it happens delayed perforation minutes later due to insufflation placing pressure on polypectomy site so once you have done polypectomy don't go on inflating the colon just to see the things you have, you would have done diagnostic colonoscopy beforehand and when you attack the polyp just do a polypectomy make sure it is done nicely no bleeding and then come out if there is a perforation obviously if there is a frank peritonitis you would go for surgery but however if you are working in an advanced gi setup and you have the clips available and there is no great soiling of the peritoneal cavity you can apply over the scope clip clip at the perforation and close the perforation and treat the patient conservatively otherwise to conclude ladies and gentlemen endoscopic polypectomy is a very useful and important therapeutic procedure it requires good quality video endoscopes good accessories and well trained endoscopist and endoscopy staff it should be done in a setup where treatment for complication like bleeding or perforation is available thorough assessment of the polyp plan the procedure in advance estimate endoscopic resectability don't start if you are not sure whether you can complete the procedure or not in such a scenario you can ask your senior colleague to be with you or take the patient to an advanced gi setup position the polyp scope patient and snare perfectly so that the procedure is done easily nowadays we have co2 insufflator available for endoscopy procedure and if it is available we should use co2 insufflator so it will reduce the complications of air insufflation avoid complication identify complication early and treat adequately and if the patient is symptomatic post procedure hospitalize the patient thank you very much for your patient listening thank you uh, sunil papad sir for giving a bird's eye view to start with and now we have dealt with the technical videos and then you also address to the complications also so we will take the questions along with the end of the uh, lectures uh, thank you sir now i have the privilege of uh, introducing uh, dr gv rao 
Uh, he is the director of the Asian Institute of Gastroenterology. To briefly tell about Dr. G. V. Rao, he has been uh, a university first student from the Osmania Medical College at MBBS level. Later, he moved on to Bangalore Medical College through the national selection to MS. And uh, he had a passion towards surgical gastroenterology. And then later, he was trained under the portals of uh, Professor N. Rangabashyam, the father of surgical gastroenterology for India. Then, then on, no looking back, the relationship with uh, Nagi Reddy and uh, him has produced wonders. And to his credit, he has the first uh, transgastric procedure. A notes procedure was the first in the entire world, was, bra was uh, brainchild of Dr. G. V. Rao. And now uh, I'm proud to say it is one of the WGO uh, <coughs> endorsed institution for endoscopy training, where they run training courses to high-end master's courses. In fact, they also run a very, very popular translational research center to test the new devices and the molecular level work. So the most important thing is inclusive participation at every level in the department. So it is a lesson for all of us to learn from him. So I would like to request Dr. G. V. Rao to share his thoughts. Everyone, like we have now discussed about basic endoscopy. For the surgeons to graduate from basic to advanced, what is the safe approach and what should be the line here regular diagnostic endoscopic surgeon should move on to become an advanced endoscopist. Over to you, Dr. G.V. Rao, sir. Uh, good evening at the outset. Let me thank the entire executive of the IAGS for the honor of uh, giving the space, the screen space in this webinar. Uh, and also, I acknowledge the presence of Dr. Krishna Rao, actually, who has been the mentor of a lot of endoscopies across the country. Uh, endoscopy has evolved from a simple diagnostic tool to a very, very powerful uh, therapeutic tool. At the turn of this century, if you see this, actually we have shown the, that flexible endoscopic peritoneal surgery is possible. And we start doing, showed the feasibility of doing a conventional surgical procedure through a flexible endoscope. Actually, some of you would have seen this video. Actually, this really went viral. Actually, for some of those people, youngsters who have not watched, this is an endoscopic view. You have gone from the stomach into the peritoneal cavity and used this uh, monopolar uh, hot biopsy force of those days to coagulate, secure the meso appendix, and subsequently secured the appendix at the base using an endo loop and snared the appendix and brought this appendix out to the oral cavity. Now, this has completely change the way you look at the endoscopy uh, as a whole, endoscopy as a tool. Uh, so what happened was now this flexible endoscopic evolution, actually, it has uh, shown, we have shown that from lumen, from polypectomy to simple procedures like EMR, we've gone into the peritoneal cavity and showed a peritoneal, a lapros conventional open or a surgical procedure is feasible. So unfortunately, what happened was we had a sudden jump from the lumen to the peritoneal cavity without proper understanding the various technical details and without much technical expertise and without much equipment that was available those days. But again, a feasibility that an endoscope can get into the peritoneal cavity and do some surgical procedures was shown. And this has made huge impact. And since then, all the procedures that have come seems to be a spin-off of this procedure that was shown way back in 2003. And if you see all the endoscopic advances that are happening in gastroesophageal reflux disease, achalasia cardia, bariatric surgery, subepithelial tumors, and of late you're getting more and more into artificial intelligence. So you can see this, that endoscopy has evolved from a purely diagnostic tool to a very powerful therapeutic tool, but the technical management concepts evolved from surgery. We have to be very clear that all the technical management concepts have evolved from surgery. But at the same time, when we are going from this basic to advanced techniques, I personally feel some basics were overlooked. I'll show you, uh, I'll show you a couple of examples. Now, we were talking about endoscopy in surgeons. 
Now there are surgeons who are into pure endoscopy practice. There are surgeons who are practicing both endoscopy and surgery. Now there is debatable whether surgeons have to do endoscopy, surgeons have to do pure endoscopy, surgeons have to do a combined endoscopy surgery. Now it all depends on where and how you are practicing and how much of time that you can spare. But as procedures are more, getting more and more invasive, I think basically surgeons are better equipped to do these procedures basically because they have firm, good knowledge of the basic conventional surgery or laparoscopic surgery. I can understand that surgeons who are into pure endoscopic practice, but in certain areas, I think surgeons would, these endoscopic surgeons would require some surgeons who are practicing a conventional surgery. They need their uh, assistance. Now, endoscopy is becoming more and more aggressive. And as I told you, endoscopy was purely a luminal thing. Purely it con uh, confined itself to the lumen. And we had this surgery, which usually we confined ourselves to the peritoneal cavity or to the thor thoracic cavity. But what happened was slowly this endoscopy started moving from the lumen into the peritoneal cavity. And from surgical side, we started moving from the peritoneal cavity into the lumen. There are a lot of procedures I can quote wherein the laparoscopic surgeons are going from conventional peritoneal surgery into the luminal surgery. Now, as we are doing this surgery, uh, doing these procedures, I think we have to understand a lot of things actually. We are doing something different from what we have been doing. Now, when we're doing these advanced endoscopic procedures, the question that I ask everybody is, is conventional anatomy applicable in current day endoscopic and laparoscopic practice? A simple question. See, if you ask us, any of the student, all the clinicians will claim that they know the anatomy inside out. I repeat, inside out. Anybody, you ask your I mean, third year medical student, they'll say, I know Gray's anatomy inside out. But this is a myth because the reality is Henry Gray wrote the anatomy outside in. He never wrote the anatomy inside out. So this is a lot of difference between the anatomy as we're going from outside inside and coming from inside outside. So the conventional abdominal anatomy is outside inside. This is the abdominal wall. This is the peritoneal cavity. This is the gut wall. And this is the gut lumen. Now, if you see, conventionally, we go from outside inside and from the lumen outside. Now, but the new anatomy is inside outside. Like whenever we're doing hernia surgery, we are operating from inside going outside. Same thing happens to endoscopy when we're doing advanced procedures like poem procedures. I'll give you a simple example. When you're doing a hellas myotomy for achalasia cardia, you're going from outside in. But when you're doing a poem procedure, you're going from inside out. So when you're doing from inside out, a lot of things we have to know. For surgeons, it is very easy to know the anatomy because you're used to the anatomy. But people practicing gastroenterologists, it is very, very difficult to understand what is outside the lumen. All we know is that these three, six, uh, four positions, three, six, nine, and 12 o'clock position from the endoscopic point of view, but what lies outside is very, very important. This is very, very important to know when we are doing any of these advanced procedures. See, right, when we started doing laparoscopic inguinal hernia or any even any of the hernias, Open hernia was totally, anatomy was totally different. And we have rewritten the entire anatomy when we started laparoscopic practice from inside out. So the open surgical anatomy is totally different. The laparoscopic surgical anatomy is totally different. So we have done this. Actually, we have all gone through this. We understand this very well right now. Now, when we are doing this endoscopy also, now we have endoscopies on the luminal side, surgeries on the serosal side. What we require is to understand from the luminal side, outside, and also there is need to understand more and more of the different layers of the stomach and the lymphovascular planes to do this third space endoscopy, doctor, uh, we were talking about. So when we're doing this uh, laparoscopy and uh, endoscopic surgery, we have to unlearn the outside-inside anatomy and relearn 
and inside, outside anatomy. This is very, very important. And this is very important, especially when we are doing, because when we are doing this endoscopic procedure, there are a lot of technical variations, anatomical, structural, vascular variations that are seen. These, when you're doing laparoscopic surgery, we can identify very easily. But when you're doing endoscopic surgery and you're trying to go outside the lumen, it is very, very difficult to see what are these variations. And you should be aware of all these anatomical variations and vascular variations. Why I'm talking about this is actually some time back, actually, I've myself seen an endoscopy workshop where a very senior gastroenterologist was performing a POEM procedure. A posterior myotomy was being done. And when the myotomy was completed, the gastroenterologist says that I can see the pericard. So unless and until we, we don't see the pericard in the posterior myotomy, so the anterior side. So unless and until we know the anatomy properly, I don't think we should be doing this advanced procedure. So the inside-outside anatomy is totally different from the outside-inside anatomy. And we should be very well aware of this. And I reiterate, surgeons are in a better position to do these procedures because of better understanding of anatomy. Not only anatomy, I'll show you physiology. Now, what happened was surgeons were more used to surgical procedures than anesthetic procedures. Now, MIS is all about working in positive pressures in potential spaces. We all know this, actually. So now, is conventional physiology applicable in current day practice? No, absolutely no. When we have started doing open surgery, the intra-abdominal pressure was equivalent to the atmospheric pressure. When we started doing laparoscopic surgery, the intra-abdominal pressure is more than the atmospheric pressure, and the entire physiology changed. And the entire concept and the entire anesthesia principles have changed based on this and we switched over from conventional room air to our carbon dioxide because it gets absorbed faster. And with endoscopy, we know that the luminal pressure is more. It's creating some sort of a compartment. If you are doing a prolonged procedure in the lumen, it creates some sort of a compartmental pressure. And if you are using air in these procedures, obviously, patients will have some amount of morbidity. That is the reason why we are advocating to change over to carbon dioxide as much as possible whenever we are doing this advanced procedures, which take a lot of time. And when you're doing third space endoscopy, we are creating a compartment and we are insufflating gas under high pressure. In spite of the technological advances, we have a carbon dioxide insufflator, which we can warm the carbon dioxide and send it at a selective pressure. But even today on the endoscopic side, we don't have control pressure. It just says low, medium, high. That's all. That's all. So we should have an insufflator on the endoscopy side, which is similar to the laparoscopic insufflator so that these submucosal pressures, when you're doing this prolonged pressures, we know a lot of physiological changes occur. The anesthetist is complaining. There are a lot of changes that happen. So unless and until we regulate and unless and until we have more advanced equipment to regulate this flow of carbon dioxide, I think we're bound to have some complications and some morbidity in these procedures. The third thing is about the cross-sectional imaging, especially for advanced endoscopy. See, most of the endoscopic procedures are done, most of the advanced endoscopic, like achalasia, SCT tumors, or wand drainage, pseudosis, bariatric surgery, are all confined to esophagus and stomach. So whenever we do these procedures, now we get a CT scan. Now, either it is a sagittal scan or a transverse scan or a coronal disease. What happens in this, suppose if you take a transverse or a coronal section, like this is good for esophagus. I'm absolutely sure this is good for esophagus. But when it comes to the stomach, see, suppose this, is, this scan does not give us a good indication. Take, for example, a wall of pancreatic necrosis. Sometimes these extend onto the anterior side of the stomach along the lesser momentum. If you see a scan like this, we'll never be able to see whether this has gone to the anterior side. I personally feel that you should have sagittal sections, especially when you're doing any advanced endoscopic interventions on stomach. Here, this shows the line in which the endoscopy is going. You can see the anterior side of the stomach. You can see the posterior side of the stomach. So you know the relation of this pathology 
whether it is in relation to the posterior wall or the anterior wall. And also, if you have or very careful about collaterals, collaterals are best seen in the sagittal sections. So suppose if you are doing a walled off necrosis, you want to put it into a self-expandable metal stand. I know endoscopic ultrasound shows that so whether vessels are there or not, but if you're doing a sagittal section, I'm sure you'll be able to see very good collaterals on the wall. So I personally believe that whenever we are doing even bariatric procedure, suppose if you're doing a bariatric procedure and you start fusing from anterior wall and posterior wall, there could be a lot of uh, uh, anatomical variation that you see unless and until you have a good cross-sectional imaging, we should not, we'll be ending up with a lot of complications. So this is for mostly for anatomical structural abnormalities, adjacent visceral structures, blood vessels, and gastric and perigastric vessels. I'll just show you a couple of, one example actually in bariatric surgery. Now this is the ESG that we're talking about. It's a very good procedure. It has shown that endoscopists now can now do fair amount of good suturing. There is no doubt about it. Now it is picking up the thing, and but it is a semi-blind procedure, mind you. Where are we taking the vessel? You're taking some time on the greater curvature, some time on the anterior wall, some time on the posterior wall. This is a semi-blind procedure. <clears throat> and in spite of this, most of the bites are not full thickness bites as been claimed by this technique. I'll show you a video of this, but the complications are basically very minimal because stomach is extensively perfused. Even if you Clip three vessels, we know during surgery, nothing is going to happen. Three major vessels, but the stomach is still going to survive. I'll show you. See, this, these, suppose this is the patient who has undergone an ESG procedure. Now we can see that after all the multiple sutures that are taken, only two or three seem to be full thickness sutures. I'll show you. And gastric perf, I mean, in the current day practice, because we know the stomach is extensively perfused, we can take use of this uh, indigo cyanine green to check for the perfusion after the procedure. I'll just show you one example of this. Now, this is the patient who has undergone an ESG procedure. Now, come back with the thing. Now, we can see the endoscopic view. Now, just watch the endoscopic view. See this. Most of the sutures are only mucosal sutures. This looks like an ulcerative colitis colon with some amount of trabeculae across. And all the sutures have given way. So, endoscopic suturing is shown that the suturing can be done, but this requires a lot of expertise and we majority of the sutures are not full thickness sutures as in what, what is being practiced. So you require a lot of, I mean, a lot of skill to take a full thickness, but it is not very simple. And whenever you're taking, you're very scared that something outside would be there and then you damage this. So most of these people who have undergone these ESG procedures seem to be coming back for some sort of intervention. Again, see this procedure, ESG done, actually only two full thickness bites here. Rest of all the mucosal bites, which are not going to be of any. Uh, again, uh, the duodenal diversion procedure that we talk about, actually all the endoscopic procedures that have evolved, they all are based on this uh, bariatric surgical procedure that we have developed, showed the basic science behind it, basic reason behind it, doing this. And we have some endoscopic procedures which are evolving all this, and we have to wait for the long-term results of these to come. The long-term results are promising. They could be bridged to surgery, but certainly the it could be a game changer in future, especially for metabolic surgery. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, I am still not convinced. Umpteen number of procedures, actually Dr. Krishna Rao is there to vouch for me. Right from 1990s, we have seen endosynch, gatekeeper, enteric, synthion, strata, everything came, everything went off. For six months, they showed that it showed some improved result, but nothing seems to have stayed. And laparoscopy is uh, fund application still seems to be the gold standard. And again, we have a procedure to stimulate the lower esophageal sphincter to augment the LES. This again has not been proved. And right now we have newer anti-reflex procedures. We have to wait and see how effective they are. But I personally feel for gastroesophageal reflex disease, still we have an absolute good evidence to show that these procedures are good because these are semi-blind procedures. We are not doing a complete justice to this restoration of the pathology that we are doing it here. These are just blindly clamping, blindly suturing from the endoscopy side without knowing what is on the other side. 
So till we have further results on this, I personally again feel that laparoscopic fund localization is still the gold standard. We still have to wait for the results to come from the other endoscopic procedures that have come. Still awaiting for the ideal technology that can compare itself to laparoscopic fund duplication. Uh, so achalasia cardia, yes, actually it's a beautiful procedure that is being done. But again, we should understand that uh, there is a significant amount of reflux that is happening in this patient. There is no way that we can see which patient will have post-operative reflux. The myotomy is phenomenal. We all agree that the myotomy can be done excellently using an endoscopic procedure. But what happens to those 30 to 40 percent of these patients who end up with reflux? We have some procedures that are coming up, but as in today, I personally again feel all these patients who have followed endoscopic myotomy is a good procedure, absolutely phenomenal procedure. But if these patients come back with reflux, I think some sort of laparoscopic fundoplication option, some sort of a wrap should be offered to these patients so that they should not be on long-term PPIs. But it is not again necessary that all these patients go in for reflex. So reflex is one procedure that has to be kept in mind. Even a lot of gastroenterologists, surgeons who are practicing world over feel that will reflex kill a poem procedure. For the initially, there was a lot of denial that there is any reflex following poem procedure, but now people seem to be accepting it. And now we started getting some endoscopic fundoplications that are being adapted. But again, this cannot be a replacement to the laparoscopic fundoplication that we do. So we just have to wait for these results to come before we uh, say that these procedures can be superior to endoscopic procedures. Again, an endoscopic gastrogenostomy, I am absolutely a, take it with a pinch of salt because basically two reasons. One, it's an anastomosis we are creating is a one centimeter anastomosis compared to two to three centimeters anastomosis that we create. It will act like a, I mean, I mean more, more like an hour glass actually. I mean, it might, people might be able to take liquid and some semi-solid diet, but it may not be a replacement to conventional gastrogenostomy. Third space endoscopy is very important actually. Now, <coughs> we have good understanding of the third space now. We started Removing these mucosal lesions better. Sunil has shown how effectively we can remove this uh, mucosal polyps. Now we have got a lot of subepithelial tumors which can be very effectively removed. And why I'm saying this is because the subepithelial tumors are being increasingly detected because of good cross-sectional imaging. And we have umpteen number of procedures that have come uh, to tackle these subepithelial tumors which are located at different locations. We have a different procedure for it. A uh, subepithelial uh, 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 tumor that is located in different positions. It is not that we can do a one procedure for everything. Uh, I can stop at any time, Kangival, just let me know. But again, as I told you, why is uh, surgical training important? There are a lot of procedures wherein you can do a combined endoscopy and laparoscopic procedure. It is not possible that a lot of these procedures can be done with purely endoscopic technology. So we require some laparoscopic assistance also. So there are a lot of hybrid procedures that are coming in. So it, the surgeons are better placed to do these procedures, like this procedure that the G junction growth gist. Actually, you can see this. We do it under endoscopic assistant using a PEG catheter through which we go and do this procedure. And again, full thickness tumors like this, you can resect them endoscopically or laparoscopically, but the sutioning has to be done laparoscopically. Obviously, after you've done a full thickness resection, I don't think you should be able to do this. But there's one procedure that is very, very important, actually, that I keep showing, like this procedure. It is called a NEAT procedure, especially early gastric cancers. Suppose if we have, now there is a lot of fear that there could be peritoneal dissemination of these cancer cells into the peritoneal cavity. Now, these procedures, suppose if you think they require a full thickness resection. Now, obviously, when you're doing a full thickness resection, there's a chance of splitting into the peritoneal cavity. So now here, what we do is we do submucosal injection endoscopically, do a seromuscular incision here. This is the complete. We have encircled the entire tumor now. Then you take a seromuscular stitch here and invaginate or bury this tumor onto the luminal side of the stomach. Here we are not spilling any cancer cells into the peritoneal cavity. This is what is called as the 
clean nodes. So you can see this. This obviously requires both endoscopic and surgical skills, and surgeons are a better place to do this. You can see this, and you can use a surgical cell to make this lesion more prominent on the endoscopy side. Complete this entire seromuscular suture. And then once you have done this, you can dissect this lesion endoscopically. So you can see this a combined endoscopy laparoscopic approaches are becoming more and more popular. And for this, we require good training both on the endoscopy side and on the surgical side. And we are also talking about full thickness resection and lymph nodal dissection now. So these are all the things which can, can be done only by surgeons who are well trained both in advanced endoscopy and surgical practice. And we have umpteen number of these procedures which are going to come as a spin-off of these nodes procedures and hybrid procedures. There are so many things that are coming in uh, in the submucosal endoscopic surgery. You can place uh, simulating monitoring devices. You're harvesting tissues for basic sciences. You can remove tumors. You can take biopsies, nerve muscle, like you start delivering drugs into the thing. Umpteen number of things are being done uh, on the submucosal side. I think this is the future of surgery. So I personally feel surgeons are better placed to do these procedures because they have sound anatomical knowledge and they've been doing surgery, laparoscopic surgery. They have good physiological knowledge and they are better able to tackle any of the emergencies that do occur during any of these advanced endoscopic procedures. And for all those youngsters who want to practice this, it all depends on whether you want to take a pure endoscopic practice or a pure surgical practice. But I am, I personally feel you should know fair amount of endoscopy and fair amount of uh, surgical practice so that it is not possible. I mean, if you're working in a department, you're working in a public sector hospital, you can have some support from the medic, uh, the people who are doing pure endoscopic practice. But if you're practicing in periphery and you want to do these procedures, I'm sure you'll require both endoscopic and laparoscopic and open surgical skills. Thank you very much once again for the patient. Thank you, Dr. J. V. Rao, sir. In fact, um, this has pepped up, I'm sure, all the thoughts of the surgeons who are here. It looks like the technology is now uh, going integrated. Maybe it is soon the MCA considers one MCH course in interventional surgical gastroenterology or yeah. interventional gastroenterology as a separate thing. I think a MS general surgeon should be able to take it because it gives you a different perspective. And I am sure this needs a different set of training. I think we are in now the same phase of early 90s where lab coli was looked upon in a different aspect and lab coli has revolutionized. I'm sure the combined endoscopy, laparoscopy and combined hybrid procedures are going to be the future. And this is going to be a different platform for people to learn and work. Thank you for bringing that uh, viewpoint, Dr. Rao, sir. I'm sure uh, we are going to challenge you with more tough questions in the panel. Uh, with that, we now move on to the next important agenda. We move on to the panel discussion. Um, now, may I now request uh, all of you to stay back. The esteemed panelists for the day will be Dr. Raman Goel, President of the Society. Then we have the uh, father of Indian endoscopy, Professor B. Krishna Rao, sir. He is also the chief advisor for the IAGS. We have uh, our uh, very trusted trustee, past president of the uh, IAGS, Dr. Subhash Khanna, rightly, currently the director of the International Academic Affairs. And he also heads the COVID uh, response team for the IAGS. And he has been in the task force in the national and the uh, Assam level. And he has been interested with the major responsibility of handling government funds for COVID welfare. So we welcome Dr. Subhash Khanna, sir. And our ever dynamic uh, treasurer, ardent endoscopist, again, once again, a brilliant teacher of colonoscopy. He takes all the patients to teach colonoscopy and he spends more time across the smaller third level and entire three cities and entire three towns and villages to educate. And he operates from a center in Kolkata, Nightingale and CRDA Hospital. We'll be hearing to his uh, expert advice also. Then the most important person, uh, we have the chairman of the 
Indian Private Medical Colleges Association. And uh, he is the co-convener of the Endoscopy Board. And he's the chairman of uh, GSL group of uh, institutions in Rajamundri. And he, in fact, has uh, proven himself a Thai 3 city can at par host any national or international program. And he has one of the best uh, virtual simulator uh, labs in the world. And uh, in fact, we are privileged to have him. And uh, in fact, uh, I am proud to have uh, my co introduce my co moderator, Dr. Joy Abraham, who mooted the entire concept. And thanks to G. V. Rao sir and uh, Govindra sir for uh, taking and the permission given by the national leadership for running this program. And I introduced Dr. Joy Abraham, who is a surgical gastroenterologist from Gujarat State, who has done his uh, master's from Gujarat and later moved on to SGPGI uh, Lucknow for his uh, MCH super speciality. Later, he has come back to his uh, native place, Ahmedabad. He is right now the teaching faculty in the government hospital, as well as he is the consultant in the Sims and Excel hospitals of uh, Ahmedabad. I'm proud to have him as the uh, co-moderator co for that. So with that, now I move on to the first question. So I would like to ask Dr. Krishnarav, sir. Sir, you have been, uh, in fact, I am privileged to learn in the same place where he does start the first endoscopy in government private right hospital in the South India. What is the historical basis of a surgeon performing endoscopy? I think few issues are addressed by Dr. Govindra already. And I'd like to hear from you, what are the challenges you have faced in training yourself and training others? I'm sure you are the very early surgeons who demonstrated ERCP across the country, demonstrated laparoscopic cholecystectomy across the country. So you would have had unique challenges en route, learning the technique and training the students. We'd like to hear from you, Dr. Krishna Rao, sir, about your words and experience. Sir, please unmute yourself, sir. Thank you, uh, Kanagavel, and uh, good evening to all the other panelists and the uh, co-participants. My interest in endoscopy came when I saw an article in Science Magazine regarding a fiber optic uh, image transmission and its use in colonic uh, tumor uh, surveillance. So my research ended up with Professor Morrissey in Wisconsin, USA. Unfortunately, he said that he will not train anybody other than Americans, but my friends in Loyola University asked me to come over. When I went there, to my good luck or to other person, a person who was supposed to go to Morrissey for the following two weeks, had a car accident and that slot was vacant. And I was able to fit into that and have real good training under Professor Morrissey in all the three aspects of upper GI, lower GI, and ERCP. People will not know that we had the Kodak carousal, which contains about 20, 100 slides. And like that, there were 20 carousals after the morning session with the patients, direct upper GI colonoscopy and ERCP, whole of the evening, up to whatever time I wanted, I could sit with the carousal with self-explanation uh, and uh, diagrams and photographs to see and recognize various aspects of endoscopy in the human being. There, the entire thing was done under full anesthesia. Patient was completely anesthetized and it took him two to three hours to recover from anesthesia. The revelation came and I went to Tokyo, Tokyo Medical College, where they used to speak a bit of English at that time. And there I found, to my great surprise, that the patient came, sat in front of the doctor, and the doctor, after the courtesies of Boeing, sprayed his throat, passed the instrument down the throat into the stomach, inspected it, took it out with the patient sitting in the chair. He was not anesthetized and he was quite free. I mean, I had problems 
after training in states of anesthetizing patients in the in Chennai, some of them have been aspirated by recovering from the IV anesthesia. So it was not a great thing for us to change over from no sedation to just a local full sedation to just surface anesthesia and do the procedures. The most important thing is that majority of my teachers, my professors, were saying, Krishna, you're passing a rice stew. What are you doing? The only person who was of great support to me was late Professor Sarachandra, who is a walking encyclopedia of surgery at that time, saying that he found that identification of ampulla under the endoscope was much easier than an open operation. What we had was fiber optic instruments with a teaching attachment. Later on, we had a connection between the camera uh, with, uh, with the endoscope, a camera, and to a television so that other people could watch. Today, the fiber optic scopes are all become obsolete, and we are on CCD, where images are exceedingly clear and can be transmitted all over the uh, hospital, but across the world. Now, when you come to the training, as in majority of the cases, people are not willing to train others on the fear that they will not be, they'll be a competitor to them. But as I've gone from India to States, to UK, and to Japan, they were willing to train me in all these aspects. So I took training, practiced upper GI endoscopy for two years, then went for training for colonoscopy, and then perfected it in the next two years, then came for ERCP, and again went through the therapeutic procedures. For me, at that time, Nip Suhendra and Peter Cotton were contemporaries who were doing as such amount of therapeutic procedures, and I, I learned a lot from Nib Suhendra as to how to make things simple and easy for us in the third country, the poor thing, to do the they to do procedures. He demonstrated how injecting adrenaline into a tumor tissue in the esophagus will cause necrosis and will give relief from dysphagia. He also showed how to prepare a CBD stent. He also showed how to prepare various accessories like a polypectomy snare, sphincterotome, which you can do it yourself in your hospital. Now, all these uh, gave me strength to come back and do these procedures, develop them in my own way uh, from scratch because to import them from Japan or from states, it was pretty expensive, and we could not afford uh, discard one, one, one use material. Later on, I found that surgeons and physicians came to learn endoscopy, therapeutic endoscopy, because when they came to my center, they had the uh, opportunity of not only watching the endoscopy and therapeutic procedures, I was also doing the laparoscopy, and a little later, I was using laser for various other relations. So the surgeons, when they came to me and I saw that I was able to do nearly 80% of operative GI surgery endoscopically, they were surprised and kept asking me as to why they should be so. Uh, surgeons. I had to tell them that you have to be a surgeon so that you will be able to deal with any complication that you may cause to the patient. That was particularly mentioned by our uh, uh, the father of the medical gastroenterology, Dr. Madhada Gopal. His comment was, Krishna you are a surgeon. If, you, uh, if any complication occurs, you can go in and you can correct whatever the complication is. If I do something, and if anything goes wrong, I have to wait for my surgical colleague to come a couple of hours or sometime later on the day to tackle the problem. So, 
the endoscopy was shown not only in my center, but I used to travel with the Olympus instruments to various centers and demonstrate the, and the diagnostic and therapeutic endoscopy. I can, say, I can still remember one instance where Dr. Arul Raj in Tutikurin asked me to come and do an endo, uh, show an endoscopic procedures for the IMA. When I landed up there, he took me to the, the uh, Kalyan Vantap uh, marriage hall where there were more than 1,000 uh, IMA doctors. And I was doing an endoscopy on the Kalyan Vantap stage and that was being transmitted through the endoscopy camera to various uh, televisions that were positioned in that hall. That was the largest exposure that I have had when I was demonstrating the endoscopy. Again, people like late Dr. Kushumbhuti, chairman of the Cancer Institute at AR, who was clearly saying, Krishna we have an endoscope, we use it, we think that there is a tumor, but then when we go in, we don't find the tumor. It is vice versa. When we think there is a tumor, there is no tumor, or when they see it is normal, there is a tumor. So he wanted me to come and train people in Cancer Institute to, uh, to familiarize themselves with the endoscopic anatomy. You will realize that till uh, 1968, 1970, uh, 88, we did not have the CCD uh, video endoscopes. And the way we could teach was with a teaching attachment and with a, with a camera attached and transmitted to a single television uh, in the room. So the problems that we had was the, uh, the uh, colleagues of my, our own profession say that there is no importance for doing an endoscopy. But over the years, Within a decade, they all found out how effective and how important the endoscopy is and to diagnose and, and many a time do procedures and thereby avoid surgery. And now today we have had G. V. Rao explaining to us so many different types of surgeries that we can do today that a surgeon has to learn not only surgery, open laparoscopy, but also to handle an endoscope and combine it with other modalities to the benefit of the patient. Thank you, sir. In fact, uh, we are in a very, very, very blessed uh, platform because we never have to undergo all the rigors of uh, difficulties what you have undergone. And in fact, uh, I, I, we are very thankful to you that in the process of learning, you never compromise on teaching others to do. And the challenges you have faced are enormous. And in fact, uh, as uh, behalf of the IAGS and the entire participants, we have close to 700 participants now being with us. So on behalf of them, we definitely share our gratitude and thanks for uh, putting us in the right platform. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Kalgoy. Now I hand over for the next question to my co-moderator, Dr. Jai. Thank you, sir. So the next question is to Dr. Ishwaramurthy, sir. As he rightly pointed out, this is the path less traveled and practice, practice, practice is the key. So I would like to ask Dr. Ishwaramurthy, what are the guidelines or does the Medical Council of India have any guidelines for the number of procedures assisted or done so that a surgeon is certified? Okay, you are certified to go ahead with the procedure. Does, is, does this, is it there in India or are we supposed to follow the guidelines, the American Board of Surgery or any other guidelines? Can you just elaborate on that? Because this, was, this would help us in tackling the medical legal issues which are equally important in the coming future. I think um, what I want to say, I, whatever I could see from the MCA point of view, there is no arbitrary or absolute number of endoscopy you have to do. 
what they have done is they have listed out the number of GI disorders as a postgraduates of general surgery. There is MS postgraduates. They have to see both the open laparoscopic and endoscopic management. So they have given a broad based idea and all the medical colleges are expected to possess in their own department of surgery an upper GI endoscopy and a diagnostic colonoscopy. This is the requested. And they are also posted, all the surgeons, especially the MS surgeons, at least one month in the first year and another month in the second year. And during that time also they are expected to see various cases. But having said that, I don't think anywhere I can see that these are the numbers they have to fill in in the logbook in order to become a qualify to become like an American board. Like, for example, it's used to be the same even in it's not only in our country, even in so-called developed countries. I think things have come to some sort of streamline only in the last few years, even sages. And when they've done a successful APS, then American Board of Surgery, they took it. OK, everybody want to board certified as a surgeon. During your training, that first year, second year, these are the curriculum you have to undergo and you have to pass this examination of FES through the SAGES. Like that JAG, that is a joint advisory board in UK also, they criticized because the surgeons, we are all very keen, technical people, we like to operate and we go more, spend more time. So we, we think, I think that from the postgraduate perspective, they are not given enough direction, enough opportunities, there are not enough trainers to train them properly. This is the lacunae. And uh, I am fortunate that I've been brought up during my post-graduation in the southern part, like in Tamil Nadu, there were some fascinating teachers. I learned endoscopy and I was there in UK. I know the system how 10 years. So that's why I able to do an endoscopy, ERCP. And I was fortunate to have a mentor, even though I spent only a few days with G.B. Rao and Nagi, I'm sure. Uh, though motivation, Nagi, when he came first to initiate and uh, install my department like 20 years ago now, uh, we are now taking a passion. I think it is like uh, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, I think they have sp uh, spread this passion to the old world. Now the IAG has taken this as a, in a bigger way and their responsibility to teach our younger surgeons in their own platform and own way. And we have done, this is the number, minimum number of uh, endoscopy. In my opinion, as I said, the minimum requirement of upper endoscopy, even for a sages as of now, is around 25. And around 25 flexible and 50 colonoscopy. More or less same number is required. It's not an absolute number, as we know now. It is not the technical skill alone. It is the assessing the skill and also acquiring more cognitive skill, like image enhancement endoscopy, third space endoscopy, therapeutic endoscopy has widened the scope. So there is a lot more to learn as rightly pointed by Kanagavel and also are endorsed by GB Rao. We need to have MCH by itself for a therapeutic endoscopy. So there is a long way to travel, but we need to put our students in the right path. So they have to at least have the confidence to hold the endoscopy, do the procedure confidently with the safety of the patient at the center. That is our important. At the end of a diagnostic endoscopy, patient should, health should not be jeopardized. That quality assurance, it is our responsibility as an association. We can't expect everything from MCI. We have to read between the lines and carry on doing a quality control in our own way. Thank you, sir. That was uh, wonderfully answered. Thank you. Uh, now we move on to the next important uh, pertinent question. In fact, uh, many of the participants uh, in the chat box have also asked one question. Sir, uh, what are the available training platforms? In fact, uh, they would like to know about their short-term training, structured fellowship programs, exam-based fellowship programs, and long-term training in national level and international level. In fact, uh, Professor Subhash Khanna was the first person to install the US, now the robotic equipment. And I'm sure he was the first one who brought therapeutic endoscopy into the East. right? And uh, he has hosted many courses for endoscopy as a standalone course, as a single team course. And he has been privileged to host both the EFAGS program and first ever uh, advanced fellowship of uh, interventional endoscopy was hosted in Guwahati. Uh, Professor Subhash Khanna, sir, what are the challenges you feel uh, a student have to undergo? What are the training facilities right now which are available for a surgeon?
to get trained in endoscopy. So please unmute yourself, sir. Sir, I would request you to remove the headset, sir. You can use your uh, remote, uh, disconnect from the laptop, sir. Sir, you are uh, not audible, sir. You are, we are able to see you. Sir, we will come back to that question a little later. Maybe you can set right things. Now I, I hand over the next question to Dr. Joy, please. Uh, my next uh, question is to Dr. Ghani Vaskar Rao. Sir, again, the issue comes up of uh, training, numbers, practice. Yeah. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. The issue is of training, numbers, practice. But most of the, the residency programs worldwide, not in India, worldwide, is facing a problem that the gastroenterology colleges are increasing the number of procedures to be done to be certified to do certain procedures. For example, an upper GI scopy, colonoscopy, these numbers were increased. The GI residents do get a lot of endoscopy to, do, to be done. However, in the surgical training, correspondingly, the numbers go down. So my question to you is, since you indulge in so much innovative training with simulators. Can these simulators bridge the gap? Yes, definitely. The simulators, what uh, now the virtual simulator, what to calculate regular endoscopy training that one of the patient concern, uh, one of the patient concern, and again, and the privacy of the patient, and uh, doing the training, and I can't hand out to the endoscope directly to my resident ask him to do the endoscope of the patient. And now the patient cancers and patient privacy is increasing now. And uh, the including clinical examination also a lot of problem for the uh, regular patients for the, uh, because the 100 students, one patient to examine. Like that, all the problems are coming. Now the simulator is one of the solution for the virtual simulation. And uh, we can do all the things, whatever the manors are doing the endoscopy, can do the endosco virtual endoscopy now. Because no, when you're doing endoscopy, how much air can be infiltrated into the stomach? And how, how we should not touch the mucosa when you're doing endoscopy inter insertion. Again, from the going from the esophagus, entering the esophagus, how can I avoid the vocal cords going inside? If we can try and for the 100 times or 200 times or 300 times. Once the expertise in the manoeuvre, and automatically you can do the one time with the endoscopy of the patient. Previously, and the under surgeries, you assist. You do one surgery like that. What is the previous norms? Not now, not like that. If you if if you do under the endo, uh, simulator endoscope, you can directly do scope. At that time, don't cost involvement, and there's no loss of the flexibility of the scope, and the durability of the scope also going to come much more. And you can do the very very best to the uh, things, and also lot of. Uh, in the monitor, you can show, uh, you can show whatever uh, uh, this uh, uh, doing the maneuver, if you're correct or not. It will it, tell you where is wrong, where is right. Everything will tell you. And on the way, by side of the uh, monitor, the, how the endoscope entering the stomach. Clear diagram. The endoscope thinks if you enter into the stomach, enter into the antrum, enter into the duodenum, and third and fourth part of the duodenum. When you're taking up the scope, usually you just you take up the scope directly out. When you take up the scope, how the stomach is react, react, contractibility. How to uh, uh, give a honor to the anatomy of the body. It also shows like that. That's why including patient difficulty, real difficulty, ah, uh, ah, uh, because when you become more real. That's why physically, mentally, everything can be done by the uh, simulators. Thank you, sir. Thank you. In the coming days, maybe the endo the simulator will help the rest of the colleges. So that we can accelerate the Thank sir, you, sir. Please mute yourself, sir. Your audio is heard. Time being yeah. mute. Dr. Jai, please continue. Yeah. 
thank you thank you yes rao sir for the wonderful okay. information okay thank you dr jai now i move on to professor subhash kanna i think uh, thank you bharat for looking into the audio issues and thank you kanna sir for uh, switching to your other uh, internet and a new device kanna sir uh, i hope you heard the question the formal training programs which are yeah i i heard the question i heard the yes sir yes, but now am i audible now perfect sir you are perfect you remain in the place where you are sir you look you are comfortable okay. here i i yeah i okay can i come back can i go well uh, you are perfectly audible sir you want me to repeat the questions or you listen to the questions sir no no that's fine that, no that's fine that's fine can i go well please okay. go ahead and thank you sir. thank you for that yeah thank you for that question i know this is one uh, burning issue in the minds of most of the young surgeons who want to undergo endoscopy training we have just heard professor krishna rao how he went through many places uh, and uh, there was when endoscopy used to be there in the hands of medical gastroenterologists it was very difficult to get yourself trained uh, and in fact when we look all over the country we see there are only very few centers giving endoscopy training iages has taken the lead in the last 4 5 years we Uh, there is no denying the fact that we are leaders in this now uh, today almost all the 14 training centers under iags the iags endo training centers have both training uh, facility for laparoscopy mm-hmm. and gi endoscopy a surgeon who wants to get trained in endoscopy first look for a surgeon where he can get trained by under a surgeon that is one because a surgeon can train a surgeon better second the way we were trained we in 1996 uh, even i had met dr nip sohendra who said you are a very busy surgeon it may be difficult for you to pick up uh, therapeutic endoscopy so what we did we joined uh, for short fellowship courses i was trained by rakesh tandon in uh, aims for a short course so today when we look at the training facilities first that you have gone to mute mode to please unmute go to one of the 14 record endorsed training center or fellowship or a long class hello you are okay sir yeah i am okay so that is one option for him second option is there are other centers like simast like a uh, world laparoscopic center but these two centers a surgeon will not be got any hands on the way iags gives a hands on uh, training in their center so during their courses so many of the surgeons are uh, gets hands on training program training facilities and uh, and any surgeon opting to go to go uh, endoscopy mm-hmm. training should look for these four five option if he wants to go for only a Uh, a uh, uh, lab based training he can go to cmast he can go to world laparoscopic center where there is also it's totally uh, not on live human beings but he can always join a uh, fellowship for 3 months 6 months 1 year we have one year fellowship in minimal access surgery so any center where there is a fellowship for one year uh, um, he can join where Sir, you gone? Yeah, yeah, fine. Okay. Uh, that's 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 what I wanted to say. Thank you, sir. Now I move on to the next part. Uh, I, I I I think Kanaka. Uh, well, I missed uh, AIG. I think AIG is also also went to the site and saw AIG also is offering a good amount of uh, endoscopy training. Uh, mm-hmm. So now IAGS as an IAGS, we have to look for how to train the. people who are applying to us for endoscopy fellowship second how to train them in team based uh, uh, training what uh, uh, can, uh, what ishamuti has said and how to run structured courses uh, long courses for 6 months and 1 year as because there is still a vacuum in endoscopy training uh, in india at present 
point is well taken sir in fact uh, aag is part of iags i would say i think my, from mayo clinic to any other uh, eastern countries to japan or anywhere aag has been always extending their kindness and in fact i should put on record for our falls courses they showed 30 procedures in uh, say about 2 days time for the falls courses yeah. both endoscopic and uh, laparoscopic procedures were uh, transmitted from uh, asian institute for the falls upper ga i put on record and thank uh, aag for uh, their uh, knowledge sharing and in fact i should put on record they have not charged anything for the uh, procedure from the course runners thank you aag for contributing from that aspect also now we move on to the next pertinent question uh, thank you subhash kanna sir uh, for sharing your expertise please stay with us thanks, thanks. and uh, now i go to ask our president elect dr sunil papad sir as a surgeon once you are confident about diagnostic upper ga endoscopy on one end jira sir went on to transgastric procedures and third is procedures but before moving on to that very micro specialization for a day to day practitioner for a stand alone nursing home practice what is the basic minimum set of procedures from upper ga point of view or should lay and learn any expertise in doing on a day to day surgical practice thank you kanak well first of all i must congratulate you and joy for wonderfully organizing this uh, endoscopic fiesta we are all enjoying it i must congratulate president raman goel for taking the initiative and putting all of us together i am very happy to listen to all the legends of surgical endoscopists who have been doing endoscopy say for example professor b krishna rao for almost 50 years and jv rao for almost 40 years and we are happy to be among them and with them now i personally think like jv what he said that a surgeon has to be a mixture of an endoscopist a surgeon and a laparoscopist you cannot be a pure endoscopist and for a surgeon and you cannot be a surgeon without not learning endoscopy so i have been teaching to my fellows and telling to my colleagues and friends that the surgeon should start with diagnostic upper gi many of our surgical colleagues were not doing gi endoscopy at all but after the advent of bariatric surgery many of surgical colleagues have started doing at least bariatric upper gi endoscopies once they learned the art of doing a diagnostic upper gi scopy and taking biopsy the next in line is to start doing a foreign body removal because any surgeon in periphery or in a city can get such patients where they are forced to remove the foreign bodies so foreign bodies based on their uh, the type of the foreign body sometimes it becomes tricky and it requires a surgical acumen and uh, improvisation to remove a foreign body then gi bleeding when i was a postgraduate resident almost 35 years ago whenever we used to get a patient of a upper gi bleeding it was a horror because the medical our physician colleagues were not ready to take it in emergency and the surgeons were taking but they were not having the endoscopic equipments and many a time we had to refer them somewhere where the endoscopy was being performed and so GI bleeding is one such area where i think the surgeon should master himself or herself to learn how to stop GI bleeding now when we talk about GI bleeding the most common one nowadays is a portal hypertension esophageal and gastric paralysis or a duodenal ulcer or simple mallory wish tear now if it's a duodenal ulcer mallory wish tear most of the time you diagnose and it is stopped with medicines only sometimes you may need a epinephrine injection or a coagulation with a coag probe in a bleeding artery in a duodenal ulcer the art is to learn how to do the endoscopic variceal bending for esophageal varices with the advent of its evl in last 10 15 years we have almost stopped doing the sclerosan injection technique and the glue injection for the fundal varices and duodenal varices because sometimes 
the patient can bleed to death in such situation. And I believe that surgeon should have upper hand in treating such cases, particularly when he or she is practicing in periphery and you don't have any other resources. At least one should be able to control the bleeding to save the life of the patient. Then we do get, as a surgeon, patients of stricture esophagus or strictures in upper stomach or mid stomach. And one should learn how to do dilatation of the stricture. And if possible, in advanced courses, we teach them how to put in a stent. But to start with, they should be able to be able to do the dilatation. One other important procedure is doing PEG or percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy, which is a simple extension of a diagnostic upper GI endoscopy. And it's very easy procedure for a surgeon. But whenever I've seen uh, the physician colleagues doing it, in the initial period, mostly they require a surgeon to do the abdominal part. And I believe GB is very right that whenever you have such a training, whenever you are coming across procedure where you are supposed to do something inside out, it is better to be a surgeon than a physician. And surgeon would have advantage of doing surgery and won't be afraid of doing a procedure. Then we come across polypectomy as I showed in videos. It is very easy for surgeon to do thorough polypectomy, they are well versed with the anatomy, they are well versed with the removing tumors, and they are well versed with treating complication if it does happen. So I think surgeon, the next, next uh, uh, progression is to do polypectomy. Then one should start learning the uh, bariatric endoscopy in a way that you can put an intragastric balloon. Now, putting an intragastric balloon in the stomach by upper GI endoscopy is a very easy procedure and can be learned within five procedures, I believe. It's not difficult at all. If one has to learn the concept, and once you learn the, learn the concept, it's a very easy progression to be able to put the, the bariatric balloons which we are putting in the stomach. Then, uh, one, once one learned the upper GI endoscopy. The next thing, sigmoidoscopy, as Dr. Ishwarmuthi mentioned, is very easy. And even by watching 25 procedures, one can easily learn the procedure. Now, with the advent of IAGES pro uh, programs like uh, EFIAGES and FAGI, many surgical colleagues are being trained and given certification. People like us who went to AIG for several days and saw the masters doing the procedure, discuss with them. I used to, I used to be at AIG and uh, from 7 a.m. till 1 a.m., 2 a.m. with GV Rao and always wondered how can some people work like this. And still they are working like that and kudos to them. So many surgeons have learned GI endoscopy. But colonoscopy is one thing which requires some skill, some training and it is easy for surgeon to learn that once the surgeon knows colonoscopy, he can do polypectomies and he can even close the perforation with uh, over the scope clips if it is there. And as GV has already published some transcolonoscopic uh, intraperitoneal procedures and it is also published by other surgeons and endoscopies. So notes has also come in. Previously, we used to think that perforation means laparotomy Nowadays, it is not like that. Because we are doing transcolonoscopic intraperitoneal procedure, one has understood that, okay, if you have a perforation with a small biopsy forcep, you can close it with a clip and treat the patient conservatively and watch for a few days. And if nothing happens, then patient goes home. Now, colonoscopic bleeding, sometimes we come across lower GI bleeding. And these patients, we may need to do and... Uh, semi-emergency colonoscopy. And I think GI bleeding still lends up more to the surgeon rather than to the physician. Once the upper GI scopy and colonoscopy are taken care of, then I think the surgeon needs to progress to ERCP. And later on, if he is interested in endoscopy, then he should go to third stage endoscopy like OM and other procedures. Another thing is like doing a EMR and ESD procedure or suturing procedure like endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. I believe most of the bariatric endoscopic gastroplasties 
have been started and are being done by surgical colleagues or they are being done in association with surgical colleagues and their a role of being a surgeon is very important so i believe surgeon should not discard endoscopy at all they should learn and master the art of endoscopy and as a surgeon they can definitely serve their patients by doing endoscopy and different endoscopic procedures thank you thank you sir and uh, you have given a clear cut view about how to go about the transition from uh, diagnostic to advanced procedure thank you so much please stay with us sir now joy please take over yeah the next question is to dr satyapriya desai ka sir this is not a question about a routine colonoscopic perforation this is a question to a surgeon sir how differently would you tackle a colonoscopic perforation as a surgeon not as a gastro gastrophysician we need some out of the box answers and uh, some your uh, experience sir uh, good evening can you hear me very yes, well can hear you okay uh, uh just one small information that west bengal is the first state in india where in all 22 medical colleges i personally could convince the health minister and the chief minister to have their surge endoscopies in all the departments and the bad thing is that in last 10 months only eight of them are doing uh, scopies rest of them still not packed up enough so i personally had gone to all these medical colleges and tried to teach not only and to motivate them and they many times send the whatsapp to me with their uh, diagnostic problem and i always answer them back this is a very small thing and always encouraged by iags people uh, second thing yes when uh, you are going for a colonoscopy colonoscopy i consider to be uh, one of the most difficult procedure diagnostic procedure i feel among even way difficult than ersp in the difficult colonoscopy the history first you should take whether the history is of abdominal all pelvic surgeries are there or not the history diverticulosis very acute colitis and the situation where you should be very careful if you are not that uh, experience you might defer it for few days and um, these are the very and even unsuspected internal hernia that those are the cases where you have every chances of going and perforating things but still the only first important thing as you said that don't be scared of that these are all very rare entities perforation of colon happens in one in 10000 5000 cases and uh, in my last uh, 26 years endoscopy only two perforation that also in past two years later it never happened it can happen any time but that's a different thing the first most important thing is, is perforation can happen with the tip of the scope and usually rare by the shaft of the scope and also rarely by if the ileocecal valve is very strong the cecal perforation by over distension but commonly you will make bigger loops and loops causes pain loops causes perforation so once you pass the sigmoid i always say the most difficult part of the colonoscopy is passing the sigmoid very easily very nicely without making much loop i always say my uh, juniors that if you can pass the sigmoid without making loop you are almost certain to reach the cecum if you make loop and then pass then it's very difficult difficult you feel when you are in the transverse colon so once you pass the sigmoidoscope you again de loop it then go at the splenic flexure you have some difficulty again you pass it again de loop it transverse colon usually you go most smoothly you pass to the hepatic flexure as the patient to take deep breath and again de loop it suck it and slowly go to the cecum in few words i should say these are the very important thing that you continuously go and de loop continuously de loop the colonoscope don't make the alpha loop beta loop so many loops to happen and you should understand even your experience hand you can put your hand over the abdomen you can feel sometimes your assistant even can feel they can give very nice supports extra abdominal supports in difficult colonoscopy helps you a lot and then again you change your position you always start with left lateral decubitus 
but definitely you definitely you many times if you are needed you change to supine you change to right lateral even sometimes prone position also help you when you are in the mid ascending colon and cannot reach the sicum you change it to prone position and give it into the sicum and even after that if the perforation happens sometimes you can see perforation can happen during the time the good part of colonoscopy perforation than other colonic perforation is most of the time as like me people who are very much fussy about extremely good colonic preparation your colon is much well prepared so your soiling is much less so that's a very important point to diagnose during your procedure that you have done a perforation it can be in the restroom you can diagnose within one days after the patient goes home and if he continues to have pain don't ignore it don't say okay it will go but please check it up and in late two or three days after you can have your perforation detected so in all the types you have these things few of the colonoscopic perforation if it is very small you can treat conservatively the transmural what the uh, shunil was saying the whole thickness there are little burning but actually there is no perforation which looks like a perforation but actually there is no gash under the diaphragm you can treat conservatively rest few of the cases you can go laparoscopically the many of the perforation which i repaired by my gastro medicine colleagues i am head of the department of gastroenterology in two hospitals so i always did it by laparoscopy and thorough washing and very rarely you have to make a stoma uncommonly have to make a stoma because of less soiling you can go you can yourself do nicely even my gastroenterologist people are very happy that i am always there they don't have to go to the surgery department separately and always give them the guard so as a surgeon i am not panicked any difficulty you know if you go for the operations we all know for the laparoscopy and others how many thousands you do the next case you can bring some complication complication are bound to occur but complications are always very rare if you have the good mentors like ishar murthy like professor jv rao like our father of endoscopy dr krishna rao and our team our iags courses definitely we try to give them all the points which we have learned with much of pain not like professor krishna rao but with much of pain i have also learned for hours i used to stand with the demonstration scope and i could not understand what is actually going on but that's now paying off we are trying to share all our experiences giving all the right answer that's all coming joy thank thanks you, for giving me chance thank you sir we would have loved to ask you much many more questions but however due to paucity of time we would go on to the next question to the next panel now uh, thank you joy uh, now i would like to bring up on the next important thing we move on to more uh, specifics now uh, dr raman goel sir you have been uh, i would say bold in quitting general surgery and taking up bariatric surgery as a profession i'm sure all of us do combination of procedures where asian created the model one person specializing in one procedure so being such a big center they have the advantage of that and if somebody does laparoscopic gastrectomy they does laparoscopic gastrectomy for continuously mm -hmm. so the expertise is more better but raman sir having taken bariatric surgery as an exclusive specialization and limiting every practice to bariatric surgery i am sure you would have had your initial days of struggle and i am sure you will have challenges even now it is always pertinent every patient needs to have endoscopy we are not challenging that what are your take in the management of post procedural leak it can be a sleeve or can be a bypass how endoscopy comes in do you believe in doing endoscopy by yourself what is your take on it sir okay great can i will good you ask this question so i'll tell you in 1990 i went to gv panth hospital to learn gi endoscopy Dr. Barur and Dr. S. K. Sarin were there those days, and other Shaudhary was in the surgical gastroenterology, and I got trained by them, primarily in upper GI endoscopy, and this was necessitated because I was practicing in a in my hometown of Mathura, 
and there was no gastroenterologist or anybody doing GI endoscopy, and uh, I knew that how important it is. So I went there. I purchased my first Olympus XQ20 uh, gastroscope at that time, and I was doing that throughout my life. Somewhere in '96, uh, when I was already at G Grand Medical College in uh, Mumbai. Uh, I used to carry my gastroscope and then one day the health minister visited our medical college, uh, my hospital, and he was told that this is, there is a surgeon who brings his own laparoscope and his own gastroscope to do the procedures. And he says, he was an ENT surgeon. He was said, I feel ashamed that we are, we are a minister in an institution, in a state, and a surgeon has to bring his own thing and he's training others. And I got a scope, a laparoscope and a GI endoscope within 15 days without any tendering things. And then the Japanese government also gave, so I was the only one who had two sets of laparoscope and two sets of GI endoscope for years. Till 2010, I was a teaching faculty for 16 years in Grand Medical College. So gastro GI endoscopy was very natural to me and to all my PG students who worked with me for those 16 years who, who would do it in medical college environment. So for me, when I decided to stop uh, general surgery somewhere in 2011, that was a time when I started bariatric in 2000. And I had decided that once I start doing 15 bariatric procedures a month, I will stop general surgery. So 2011, when I consistently did 15 or three consecutive months, I said enough is enough. And I will not do general surgery. And I have never repented. Now, as far as the use of endoscope in uh, in bariatric and doing it yourself, I believe, uh, like how Dr. G. V. Rao mentioned, the limitations of procedures which are very popular nowadays. I also one person who likes to have a cautionary note for surgeons: you should know your limits. So, as uh, Sunil Bhopat has very nicely mentioned, that you know you should go gradually, do this, do that. Second, I think. Uh, Every surgeon should learn endoscopy because it's a great asset. And you should start doing uh, procedure-wise, grow your uh, procedures. But very important, it is to identify a lesion. Just buying a scope and putting it inside is not enough. So when you, if you're going to get trained, get trained with somebody at least for a month. I know it's very difficult for surgeons to uh, practice in practice to spend one month with uh, like a... Uh, AIG or other major institutions in the country, spend a month not on the technical aspect, but at least identifying lesion. You are doing a procedure successfully and you have missed the lesion, that is criminal negligence. So identifying a lesion is very important. So when in bariatric, it's very, so I do all the scopies myself pre-surgery in all the procedure, all the patients, I will not do a bariatric surgery unless I have done an endoscopy myself and I see what the condition is inside. So many times it has happened, the doctors have come and they said, I don't want it in advance, you can do it on the table. And we found a, a, a carcinoma in C2, a large polyp, which ultimately turned out to be carcinoma in C2 and we had to postpone bariatric surgery. We had a patient where there was a duodenal diverticulum and in a, in a, in a chartered accountant's daughter, and that patient ultimately got it removed at AIG. I had a word with Dr. Nageshwar, AD patient was sent there and they, they removed that uh, polyp. So there could be multiple issues. Now it comes to leak. Now in leak, the, the role of endoscopy is not, is, you know, waxing and waning. Initially, stent was considered a great savior and we got very excited. We also put stents in our patients, but most of those patients, those times we did not have mega stents. I'm talking of somewhere about 2008, 2009. So we were putting two stents. And then the patients would have severe biliary reflux and a great discomfort, esophageal erosions. And sometimes the, the, the mucosa will grow at the distal end of the stent and patient will have a sort of obstruction. And it didn't help leaks much. Then the mega stents came and we realized that if you put a stent very early and say, if you have a leak in first two or three days, you put in or in the first one week, you put a stent, it used to work. But gradually the, the, the romance with the stents is going away. Uh, we are now using endoscopies more for internal drainages. 
so using double j stands for a internal drainage of a localized abscess so from early leaks now the role of endoscopy has shifted to late leaks so the leaks which happened late and there is a there is a collection you don't operate them at all you go endoscopically put a put a dj stand in the abscess and put the other end one or two or three dj stands inside and put a put a nj tube or put a stand so that you can feed the patient and gradually the abscess collapses so i think the, these are very specialized procedures somebody who is not very comfortable with these uh, stents should not do it himself because you are dealing with a patient who has a complication in your hands now you cannot offer a step wise approach in our country this is this may be possible in a western country where somebody else is paying for the procedure here the patient wants a definite answer because he is spending for the stand he is spending for the internal drainage and everything long stay so i think uh, what you are asking is very important in bariatric but with a cautionary note if you are not very good at it get help get, if you there is surgical uh, uh, endoscopist available call him if not then call don't hesitate to call a medical gastroenterologist too because the patient needs a definite solution but in bariatric endoscopy is increasingly having more role a surgeons who are already doing a, a upper gi endoscopy should start doing early bariatric procedures like how sunil said uh, putting a balloon uh, even doing uh, endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty uh, though has a limitation is a good procedure to start to get a hang of how to handle the suturing uh, inside the stomach because better procedures are coming and they will probably may not replace but probably will be answered in many situations like diabetes and all so i think bariatric uh, endoscopic uh, is, is very exciting to me yeah thank you sir now uh, you made a point that bariatric is again getting a specialized area where you deserve a mci considers as soon a mch in bariatric and metabolic surgery which incorporates endoscopic interventional training as well so it is a grown as a very very crude uh, very prudent specialization now thank you sir joy please take over uh, my next question is to dr jv rao sir so wonderful lecture we always get mesmerized by how you show us the future and uh, this question is in context of the endoscopic ultrasound and related to pancreas pancreas was initially the surgeon's domain purely pancreatic fluid collections open surgery cystogastrostomy 5 cm 6 cm then came the era of laparoscopy again quite successful now with the advent of endoscopic ultrasound which i believe is a big game changer in the i think it's the next revolution which is there how does it change the role of the surgeon is it surgery is it interventional radiology or is it uh, interventional gastroenterology what is the future sir and could it could we extrapolate the same thing to pancreatic tumors also maybe down the line an rfa into a pancreatic tumor with a pancreatic stent and it gives a five year survival equivalent to a pancre uh, pancreatic odontectomy show us the future thank you very much joy actually and that's a very good question actually now i actually it is not uh, just a fight between surgeons and endoscopists now it's this fight between the endoscopists the ercps and the endosonologists there is a separate specialty called endosonologists now if you see endoscopic ultrasound is definitely is a definite game changer in the management actually but i personally again feel there are a lot of limitations to this uh, see suppose you take an example of walled off pancreatic necrosis actually Uh, to an extent actually uh, if you do not understand the limitations of endoscopic ultrasound then you try to drain every possible walled off necrosis using endoscopic ultrasound which is again not no no not a good uh, decision decision so actually uh, endoscopic ultrasound has uh, really turned many ct uh, pseudocysts into endoscopic ultrasound wants or walled off necrosis basically because the definition is that if you see debris in the uh, in the collection it becomes a one if there is no debris it becomes a pseudocyst and endoscopic ultrasound is a great great very highly sensitive to pick up debris 
Yeah, actually, I personally feel, uh, feel actually endoscopic ultrasound is very good as long as this walled up necrosis collections are very localized to stomach or duodenum. Necrosis is less than 30%. Even our own study, huge study has shown that only very small percentage of patients require direct endoscopic necrosectomy in the endoscopic practice. Uh, similarly, actually, uh, it is it has a good role, especially for uh, diagnosing lesions. But again, uh, uh, the negative side of the thing, actually, suppose if you see a resectable pancreatic lesion in the body tail tissue. See, this, these are technically, these should not be biopsy. But see, I mean, again, we see just because the US FNA is available, FNB is available, a lot of patients start getting an US FNA, FNB for body tail lesions, which is not required, especially resectable lesion, because there's a clear evidence that uh, whenever we do this, there is some amount of spillage into the peritoneal cavity and it could disseminate the thing. And again, when we're doing an FNA or an FNB for a pancreatic head tumor, we have to be very clear as to where the needle goes in. This is never ever mentioned in endoscopic ultrasound. If, the, if, the, if you are sticking in the needle from the duodenal first part, agreed you can do a pylorus preserving, but if you are sticking in a needle from the anterior region into the head mass, obviously I don't think you can do a pylorus preserving pancreatic duodenal. See, these are a lot of things which we have to understand, which you have to talk to the endosonologists who are doing it. It's a big game changer, definitely. I mean, right now, even people are going to an extent of saying that compared to a conventional ERCP, US guided biliary drainage is safer because you're not cutting open the sphincter. So there is a big fight between the ERCPs and the endosonologists now. I don't know where it will lead to, but endoscopic ultrasound is a big game changer. It has started identifying structures, started doing some early interventions, which are very good, especially some of those early tumors. And with advances in technology, we may, we may be able to do it without surgery, but we just have to wait and see wait and see the long-term results. I'm, I'm, this is good, very good modality, but it is not that it can be extended to every possible pathology. I think we should take, I mean, we should have a, uh, we should have a board which decides which patient has to go for surgery, which patient has to go for endoscopic ultrasound. And I think uh, though both the endosonologists, surgeons have to sit together and decide what type of intervention. There are a lot of limitations actually. Once you uh, keep in, uh, the, in touch with the endosonologists, you know the limitations of endoscopic ultrasound and you know what can be done, what cannot be done. Again, what can be done is not always what should be done. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That was a great line. Thank you, GV, sir, for uh, giving a very, very honest uh, viewpoint on this. Now, I go into a sort of a difficult territory. Um, in fact, uh, people would have been bombarding me in the chat box with questions, both in uh, uh, Medinet platform and uh, this uh, platform as well. There have been a few questions on one side, flip side. In Mizoram, MBBS doctors are allowed to do endoscopy because there is nobody to do an endoscopy. In fact, this reflects the viewpoint of Dr. Satyapriya is telling, having a scope, but nobody trained is there. There is one side, we have a challenge like that. On one side, we have a corporate level challenge where our medical colleagues uh, have requested their share of the endoscopy. So we end up giving on one side. So we are in two spectrums. But the most delicate thing now comes in, what are the regulatory bodies doing into this? Uh, I would like to now ask first, Dr. Ishwar, sir, what are the MCA regulations? First of all, I would like you to address on three important areas. Does the general surgery department need an endoscopy? One. Number two, if yes, do we have a minimum mandate given by MCI regarding so much of training have to be given to a MS general surgery level? And what are the MCA regulations for both MCH and DM gastroenterology trainees towards endoscopy? Over to you, sir. Well, I think you put me in the spot now. Uh, what I can tell, as far as the postgraduates in surgery, MS postgraduate, let us speak about that. For example, MCK surgical gastro, I think Joy also can vouch. When they are trained, getting trained during their first, second, third year, 
they are given already the mca if you go in the syllabus they are given listed out these are the ge disorders you should be competent you should do the ward rounds and you should assist and do under supervision they have classically said but what they have identified they haven't put any specific numbers all these things can be managed either by open laparoscopy or endoscopy and all the departments are provided with the endoscopy and the colonoscopy that's all they have done there is no it is all as i said there is a vast difference in various parts of the country as you rightly said some part in mizoram even there is nobody even a surgeon is not there so that uh, an undergraduate qualified people so before we do anything i think what i can say is the basic concept remains same as a surgeon or as a doctor we should not do no further harm should be done to the patient before we do anything are you competent to do the procedure before you ask mca what you have done you ask yourself are you competent to do the procedure because if you get into trouble like a complication it is not your degree is going to come for your uh, rescue for example even if you have a dm gastro if you have done a procedure like in ercp badly you develop a perforation because you are a qualified people doesn't mean you are going to escape because negligence if you see it has to be defined is if you are giving the best possible care and the problems come in spite of this good standard of the care vouched by you and also supported by expert panel the experts panel are like like minded people so when we train as a trainer like all of us we know our limitations so you need to just go and like a step wise pattern for example for it is i can very easily teach somebody to do an ercp for example tomorrow there are a lot of people asking if i teach to, to today i mean ercp they have to not only acquire the skill but they have to maintain the skill for example people have claimed you have to do at least 50 ercp per year minimum i am telling you in order to maintain the skill otherwise even if you have whatever degree if you are not doing the procedure repeatedly then you become de skilled you are not able to do the procedure like even in a covid era you may see 3 months if you don't do a procedure you do go back and do that you, you know that you have to get that learning curve you are back in the learning curve you feel so you have to be maintaining the skill that is a credentialing i think american board they have done it nicely if you move from one hospital to other hospital you have to so the credentials so what as a body a responsible body we do we assess the people and we try to help them to acquire the skill and we how the obligation for them to maintain the skill how you maintain everybody have to maintain a logbook i request all my people it is not logbook is for post graduate for rest of your life you maintain a list of cases you operate problems and if there is any problem always you have a plan b or always you have a senior if not with you there at least over a phone they can help you so that's the way you have to practice and always the patient has to be at the center of your care if anything happens to the patient immediately you need to think again why it happened all when you scrub you always see what are the things went wrong in the previous case how can i do better so you have to keep on improving in your life so that's the way i think mca everybody can give you a broad based guideline i think you are the guide and you have a mentor you go and keep the safety of the patient in your mind i don't think nothing will come harm to you if you don't intend any harm to anybody no harm will come to you that's my philosophical answer to you uh, in fact now i would like to add the supplementary question also in one go ishwar sir like iags or other bodies even in fact uh, sages is doing the fas program the japanese society is offering fellowship programs are these fellowship programs a legal uh, safety or does it prove like it is a support for someone to tell that i have got trained these fellowships where exactly they fit in if in case of a trouble a, a, a surgeon lands up to see we all know whatever things like various medical council in our country or even the mci is very much in favor of the continued medical education see we never stop learning the learning is a lifelong process as we learn we acquire skill and we are given a platform like a post graduate surgery and on which we build bricks one after the other then you have to have a, you have to build your own safe house you have to live so that's why i keep telling you as an iags we are giving a efags which is actually a certificate given after 
uh, I mean, accepting that this person is having a satisfactory skill to our best of our knowledge. It is not given by a single person. It is a respectable, well-reputed association is giving you. So you have to keep. See, when there is a problem comes, you go to the court, what happens? They are going to ask you. Whether you have a qualified degree, yes, MS, yes, I have. Or you continue to do the procedure, yes. How many procedures of similar nature you have done in the last five years? Yes, I have a logbook. Have you have done an up, up, updation of your things? Less, I have been attending the CME. What's the last CME attended? I have done the EFAGS 4G course. Are you a member of any reputed association? Yes, I am an association of Endoscopy Society of Gastroenterology Society of India, ISG, ASGI, or even SAGES. You can tell. If you put point, point, point like that, you have to, I think in its court, you have to argue for yourself. I think if you do that, I don't think any medical legal problem. And all this medical legal problem is, I think, artificial. People are having a fear complex. I don't think there is no need. If you are having a basic degree, Endoscopy is one modality of the treatment for GA disorder, like a laparoscopy. You are licensed to do that, and we are there to train you, and you have to take. I think we <laughs> have to take part of the responsibility, but the most of the responsibility is lies on the person who is doing the job himself in the own setup. That's what I can tell you. Thank you, sir. Before I hand out to Dr. Joy, uh, Dr. GV, sir, you have been instrumental in uh, both the curriculum the committee for the MCH and DNB programs in medical and surgical gastroenterology. Uh, like what does the guideline say on the training part of it? Because there are some centers which they say first year endoscopy and colonoscopy or second year colonoscopy given, third year few ERCPs are given in DM training program because there is a lacuna and that's it. I, let us not transgress into it. I would like to ask you what is the minimum mandate set by the medical council for DM training that is medical gastroenterology training and uh, surgical gastroenterology training, sir. Yeah, uh, very good question again, uh, Kandagiwail, actually. Uh, now, there are stipulated guidelines for, uh, very rightly said again, uh, now now the DM uh, regulation, the DM or the DNB regulations say that <coughs> the first year resident is trained in apogee endoscopy and colonoscopy. The second year resident is trained basically in some upper GI and colonoscopic interventional procedures, and he is given as an access, he is trained in some uh, ERCP work uh, during the third year. As in today, endoscopic ultrasound becomes a subspeciality. As in today, endoscopic ultrasound is not a part and parcel of hands-on training in DM or DNB training on the medical gastroenterology side. Again, uh, this uh, training program, whether it is uh, legal or illegal actually, now, SAGES officially has a training program. It trains surgeons across U.S., especially people in the rural setup in uh, U.S., because there are not many gastroenterologists who are practicing in rural setup. So as a part of their training program, there are a lot of surgeons trained by the SAGES, and all of them are uh, certified to do screening colonoscopy and apogee endoscopy. Likewise, we also get, actually, we have a uh, program in association with SAGES. We have surgeons coming in on behalf of SAGES getting trained here in upper GI, colon, and advanced uh, procedures based on uh, what their requirement is. <clears throat> so as long as we run these uh, uh, certified courses from the societies and we defend the person during any medical legal eventualities, I think it should not be a problem training surgeons in endoscopy. We run an IAGS run, runs a very good course. But if a, if a medical legal case comes, I think it is the responsibility of the society to defend the surgeon who is trained by them, certified by them, and we should defend our surgeons uh, when in any, any medical legal case arises. Thank you, <clears throat> Dr. G.V. sir. In fact, I should want to put the record right. In fact, one Dr. Debajit Barua. I think uh, people from the Northeast should know him. He has told that I have misinterpreted the fact Mizoram has adequate endoscopic uh, facilities. And uh, in fact, he personally has started endoscopy in 1987. And he has completed 50,000 upper J procedure and more than 10,000 colonoscopic procedure. Wonderful. In fact, uh, we bow our heads to you, sir. But the question what he wants to know is, uh, and one other person by name, Dr. Heyman Patel and uh, others, they asked, on one side, you have been talking about training part. 
on the other side there have been nurses nurse practitioners doing and performing endoscopy in some centers with that in mind you should orient the training program both the points are well taken i would like to put on record right the we both the experience all the faculty here definitely vouch on learning the right experience and iags offers you a platform for you to build upon your training levels with you respects you sir i am happy that you are there as a guiding force for the entire east 50000 apache procedure is something very phenomenal iags will be very happy to host you in one of the upcoming programs to share your experience sir thank you so much over to joy for the next question thank you so my next question is to professor bk krishna rao sir so this is a, a very basic question from one of my residents this guy had done almost uh, one year of residency in after his general surgery in cvts thereafter uh, he left cvts and then waited for two years got first rank in gujarat state then get, got into mch in surgical gastroenterology after almost two years he comes back me comes to me and so and when i joined he told me the same thing sir what i see is a very strange analogy between cvts and gi surgery sir in cvts the diagnostic procedures are given to the physicians who then decides that the intervention should be done sir don't you think the same track is being followed in gi surgery as well the diagnostic procedures rest with someone so obviously the modalities will change so cvts has undergone significant decline in terms of the number of residents taking up uh, uh, residency programs now after almost 45 years of these things going on they have changed now cvts surgeons are being trained into angiography and angioplasty now they do more of the peripheral work but so this question was for my resident so i want you to convincingly answer him i think there is a difference between the cardiovascular intervention and gi intervention what is happening in cardiovascular thing is the coronary open surgery or even thoracoscopic surgery has come down because the stents have taken the place but still there are indications for open surgery in cardiovascular disease as we have already discussed the number of diseases in gi tract there is a scope for endoscopy but it does not replace surgery in all the diseases take for example if a person has got a cvd stone and a gallbladder stone a surgeon can go in do a cvd clearance and do a lap called a cystectomy or he may attempt to pass a catheter into the cystic duct into the gallbladder and flush out any debris are chhota sheshor ka tha that was the part okay i think uh, Dr. Satyapriya, sir, please mute yourself. Sorry, okay. 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 Please. Yeah. Now, in GI endoscopy, laparoscopy, open surgery, you already have other modalities coming in: EUS, angiogram for bleeders, CT angiogram, angiography, and we have got instruments of high magnification. of the mucosa to determine the histology of the tissue without taking a biopsy now are we going to become a good pathologist are we going to become a good radiologist are we going to become an ultrasonologist i think that does not arise at all if you come into a gi specialty already we have uh, cut ourselves into esophageal surgeon gastric hepatobiliary pancreatic colonic surgeries but there are people who do a combination of these the problem is that the repetitive surgeries of the same nature you get a better result than if you are going to do a jack of all trades surgery i agree that we are not going the way 
that the cardiovascular system going on for the coronary surgery, but we have a good scope for a person to concentrate on one particular area of the GI tract, as I said, hepatobiliary, pancreatic, or esophagus, etc. But again, the uh, idea of, as Jivir said, of accepting all that comes doesn't happen, cannot be accepted until there is a proof otherwise that they are superior. Poem had a great re uh, reception, but it is being reviewed. But surgery, again, is remains a basic gold standard for removal of the gallbladder, gall cholecystectomy, removal of the appendix, repair of hernia, repair of obstruction, uh, torsion of the intestine, etc. So if your postgraduate asks you, are we going the same way? Probably he is looking at it in a different manner. He expected that he will be doing all GI problems by surgery, either open or laparoscopic. He did not factor the, uh, the endoscopic procedures that have come into picture. So. I think my answer to him would be, yes, there are things shifting, but you want to be a GI surgeon, you have to learn endoscopy to be able to provide the best of treatment to the patient, either it is open surgery, laparoscopy, or endoscopic procedure. You can also say you cannot become very good at EUS because how many things can one person be an expert in? You can be an expert in a short area. Even when there is in adult, the compartmentalization of the surgery of the GI tract, you have got a pediatric surgeons also going into the same way. So it does not mean that GI tract is not uh, comprehensive. It is comprehensive to the extent that you confine yourself to one particular area of uh, specialization so that you do the best for the patient by repeatedly doing the same procedure. This comes up when you do for pancreatic surgery because the more number of uh, uh, pancreatic or urinectomy you do in one particular center, you find that the complications are much less than if a person does an occasional pancreatic or urinectomy. So I think I have answered your question to the postgraduate that the subject is what he should choose and not look at from what has happened in another speciality. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Joy, you can address the next question to Dr. Govindraj. Okay. Ishwar sir has asked, uh, answered the question along with the earlier question. Yes, yes. Sir, uh, Govindraj sir. Yeah. Ishwar Murthy sir has uh, reduced the number of procedures for surgeons saying that they are inherently, they are fish in water. So what these procedures, they are already in their medium. So the number of procedures for them, upper GI or colon would be less to obtain a certain level of excellence. The same question, does it does the same thing apply for advanced endoscopic procedures like an endoscopic bariatric or a POEM or a US guided procedure? Does the same level, the, do surgeons have an upper hand or an advantage? Or it's just a myth, it's the same for everyone? Uh, definitely surgeons have an advantage in doing these procedures. But the number of cases they have to get trained definitely needs more and more expertise because if you take a poem uh, you have you would have assisted few probably a laparoscopic uh, Heller's myotomy it can be an open uh, Heller's myotomy would have done and uh, you would be assisting him in full but when you start seeing a procedure particularly a poem and uh, you start assisting you will not be so confident you should be attached to a center where they do a number of these cases before you venture upon doing this. And secondly, 
There are hands-on courses available all over the world in India, particularly AIG offers various centers of offering this hands-on course in animal models for this poem. Once you get this hands-on course, you will not be able to do it, replicate it in the human body immediately. Get attached to a center which does a volume of cases and get to know the nuances in doing this highly advanced therapeutic procedures before you venture upon doing it in your place. And that, my advice would be, you should do these cases under supervision in a center where you are attached before you venture upon doing it at a center where you are going to start this procedure, particularly advanced procedure. And definitely you need kind of perceptorship in these programs, particularly advanced therapeutic procedures. And definitely there should be a number, at least minimum poem procedure. You should have assisted at least 10 poem procedures before you do an animal model hands-on course. And then you under a guidance, under a supervision, then you try to do an endoscopic poem course. At the same way for a laparoscope or endoscopic bariatric surgery course, you should have seen at least a minimum of 10 to 15 endoscopic bariatric procedures before you attempt the same thing in an animal model. Then once you have attempted in an animal model, try to do this procedure under somebody's supervision who has done n number of cases. So that if there is a complication, there will be somebody to help you out before you venture upon in your own center. These are probably the highly advanced procedures as Professor G.V. said, these are all very tricky. You don't know, you are operating from inside, you don't know what is there outside. And then you need to have a guidance when you do these procedures. Thank you, sir. So we have come to the fag end, but the most challenging end. There have been incidences, people told when uh, uh, alpha blockers and uh, tansilocin came for prostate, urologists have lost one procedure. The same thing when Rantidin and Famotidin came. I hope all the teachers here would have been seen at least three or four vagotomy gastrogygenostomies in the list. They have lost the procedure. But still, surgical profession or endoscopic profession is not going to die away. With the amount of adventure and new procedures coming up, as Dr. G. V. Rao sir said, the profession is going to keep going. Now I'm going to ask one important closure questions. I would like to have everybody's view shortly in a minute before closing. I know Govindraj sir, I know Dr. Uh, G. V. Rao sir, I know Subhash Kanna sir, Ishwar sir. Being a surgeon, they themselves have either employed or trained or in the process of training a qualified medical gastroenterologist under them. In fact, Asian Institute has been an exception where they have proven working together is never a competition. Collaboration leads to humongous success. This is a model Asian Institute of Gastroenterology has emulated. Rather than competing with each other, collaborating brings brilliant results. So I would now move on to the stage of telling Surgeons doing endoscopy or competition, leave alone all those things. I think we have to grow together. That seems to be the uh, correct approach. GV sir, mm -hmm. what is your uh, formula for success? In fact, you had very, very, very clear lines drawn between each other, being working with one of the most renowned person, medical gastroenterologist with you, and the most renowned surgical gastroenterology in the form of you. And in still, I could see a 35-year-old chap, sir, he will do the laparoscopic gastrectomy. I will only stand by. These were the words I heard from you when we had requested you to perform a procedure. And in fact, when Nagi stepped in to say, sir, this is an experimental procedure, so I will be doing all other endoscopic intervention my colleagues will be doing. This much of inclusive partnership you are allowing in AIG. What is your take on this word? collaboration rather than competition in AIG, sir? I, I, I think uh, this is one this thing, actually, it is not that you see, ultimately, the patient comes first, actually. Now, in a, in a day when we have so many options for a single disease, be it be endoscopic, surgical, laparoscopic, or even radiological option, I think the patient comes first. I think, uh, I think uh, that amount of this thing that we should have, and then any this thing, I think we should discuss between uh, all the specialties concerned. 
and the other thing is it's not a competition actually as uh, far as possible actually see myself actually i was doing lot of diagnostic endoscopy colonoscopy ecp but now as we move ourselves into surgical specialty it is not that our endoscopy work has decreased i mean we do, i do all the pre operative endoscopy myself intra operative post operative that itself is a big load for us actually i mean if you see my department has got upper gi colon ecp in the theater and we use it almost about 40% of our patients undergo some sort of endoscopic intervention in the pre per post operative mm. see i mean we use it extensively now i mean just example i'll tell you we started using indigo cyanine green now we have a uh, rct that is running in the department which entails that we inject indigo cyanine green into colorectal lesion to pick up the sentinel loads so this we cannot ask any other person to come into the room and at your whims and fancies just to inject and go i mean obviously you have to know these procedures actually so just i mean it is not that you have to do diagnostic endoscopy colonoscopy and compete with your physician gastroenterologist the amount of work that we can generate on the surgical side within the department itself is too huge and it is very difficult for the medical counterparts to come in at your uh, whims and fancies to come into the theater and do the procedure so for that reason actually i mean i'm i think i'm i'm doing more work in the surgical department right now than what i used to do before so it is not that you have to generate your endoscopy work and it is not a competition actually i mean i don't think there is any competition between a physician and a surgeon it, i mean i personally feel whoever has got a good hand eye coordination and who can deliver good this thing should be able to do an endoscopic procedure thank you sir govindra sir you have been uh... i know at least two of the medical gastroenterologists are getting trained under you for an endoscopy in fact it's a proud moment for a surgeon training a medical gastroenterologist in fact there is one comment from that before i address to that issue they have asked sir there have been people coming out with dnp super specialization in surgical gastro or medical gastro and they end up going for some form of more specialization like hpb or bariatric or transplant like that so again it looks like dnb or mcs level programs also have to be more refined to more specialization trust endoscopy as a specialty develops on its own this is the view point of one of the physician uh, i'm not sure surgeon here govindra sir what is your take how you have been looking at training the next generation from this perspective see uh, we i work in uh, tier 2 city uh, like uh, when you are quoting about mizoram probably that was the state of affairs for uh, our city probably 25 years before when i came back here after getting trained with professor krishna when i came back here there was nobody doing any therapeutic endoscopy and i used to watch in uh, aig and uh, amit and amul and all those uh, places where they used to do therapeutic uh, live workshops so when you come back to your city and start doing it you don't have uh, enough uh, medical gastroenterologists uh, to do that so what we that was the one that forced us to uh, start doing therapeutic endoscopy and as you grow up uh, you find like uh, professor gv said uh, you you have enough yeah, surgical yeah. workload mm-hmm. and within that enough surgical workload you find lot of endoscopic workload also and at that is the time you need more people to help you out that's the time now we have got the first uh, endoscopic ultrasound of my city now we need more people more hands to uh, do that in that case uh, it is more of an uh, kind of an uh, at uh, synchrony you have to work with the available forces in your hospital and now there are so medical uh, gastroenterologists also have joined who have taken up like gv said endoscopic ultrasound itself is by itself a specialty so you need more people focused towards that who are doing that that is the time when you get good results sir. you can't be jack of all trades all the time that have been uh, instances when my grandfather used to do uh, he used to be a surgeon he used to be an orthopedic surgeon he used to be a urologist everything but that cannot happen now so in that way there is enough case in the surgical specialty from which endoscopy itself is happening so we should be in synchronous with uh, all these specialties particularly now i, I just interrupt here uh, coming well once please see, actually please. Most, most of the endoscopy suppose we see endoscopic report you would have seen we would have seen it says ulcerated growth in the stomach or it says ulcerated growth in the antrum it doesn't specify the extent on the lesser curve 
It doesn't specify the extent of the disease. See, as a surgeon, we want a lot more information to plan for any surgical procedure. Just saying an ulcerated growth here or an ulcerated growth in the antrum, it does not make any sense to the surgical surgeon. See, we as surgeons, we know what information. There's a lot of information that we can get. The, is the stomach distending or not? Is the stomach on the lesser where, where exactly it is extending actually? And by touching the lesion, we can always know whether it is adherent to the adjacent structures or not. See, so much of information that we can get because we are seeing on both the sides. Unlike the medical gastroenterologists who just see on the luminal side. So I personally feel actually all surgical cases, actually for my side, all mm -hmm. gastrectomies, colectomies, we do the colonoscopy, endoscopy ourselves before we wheel them into the theater. Point is well taken, sir. Mm -hmm. Now I move on to Dr. Subhash Kanna. In fact, you have pioneered working in a government setup. Now you have created your own setup, an oncology setup also. So endoscopy is now challenged by oncologists, surgical oncologists as well. Let us not chart it to that territory of surgical gastroenterology or surgical oncology. But from the endoscopy perspective, you have the best of the setups in the uh, Northeast where you have worked in a government setup and the private setup. Like what are the unique uh, advice? I'm not asking you to address to the challenges you foresee for the youngsters because many questions have been coming up telling, sir, how should I get trained? What way should I get exposed? What is your future viewpoint of training, integrated training for both gastroenterology students and surgery students? What is, what will be your take on it? Uh, thanks, Kanaga. Well, uh, when we talk about gastroenterology students, uh, we all know it very well when a surgeon comes out of the medical colleges, he is never a ready-made material. He needs some more grooming, some more training. Although he has done his MS or DNB, he is not a trained person to go ahead with the challenges of life. So they need to be groomed. Similarly, we surgeons used to believe that a medical gastroenterologist is a ready-made material because he has a postgraduate or a super specialist degree. Uh, that is not. Uh, a, a DM gastroenterology may not be a ready material for it, advanced or therapeutic endoscopy, mm -hmm. particularly when there are a lot of uh, newer techniques coming up. We probably, he is uh, not getting chance to do a therapeutic ERCP because the ERCP is now, now no more a diagnostic. When it used to be a diagnostic, they used to calculate the papilla, they used to get trained. Today, it's all advanced. Whatever he's exposed, he's exposed to uh, either sphincterotomy or balloon sphincteroplasty or a spyglass. And uh, hardly he gets a chance to see any diagnostic ERCP. So they are not ready made material. Similarly, the surgeons who are opting to go for endoscopy, there's a big challenge for them because today, even today, in most of the government institutions where there are a medical gastroenterology department, surgeon may not be, particularly in corporate, surgeons are not, may not be allowed are, and, and are not allowed to uh, handle the endoscopes. So there are challenges in that. We as an IAGS and all the surgical uh, surgical uh, specialists who are dedicated to GI endoscopy, take it up as a challenge and we should start shorter fellowship courses, uh, maybe three months course because these surgeons need lesser training. I, I, I want to be quoted here. They do not need the training in basics of diathermy, basics of electrostatical energies, because they are already exposed to the smokes, the CO2, the cover, the electricity generators and all. They just need the endoscopic acumen for them. Even a three months uh, course in therapeutic endoscopy, particularly to start with maybe a ERCP, maybe a small, the, the smaller techniques, not ra rather than going to the poem and all, may be a good idea. So I think these, we the surgeons should take up these two, these uh, trainee surgeons for, so that, uh, and, 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 and one more thing, we are always talking about number of cases, how many he has done, how many has posed. A surgeon is never asked how many cases he has done when he passes the post visit. He does his MS and he very next day he comes and operates mm -hmm. in the private hospital. So this thing has come because very new techniques have come like POEM or like um, SMR and, and uh, 
endoscopy mucosal dissections here. So, so now when the new techniques are coming, they will again go for a specific training that again is separate. If I want to go for a robotic training, I need to be groomed separately. I need to be trained, trained separately. But most of the base, I will say basic th advanced therapeutic endoscopy work, mm -hmm. he can be trained uh, in any of the good center under you know, where, particularly under a surgeon, because a surgeon will understand a surgeon better. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, before going on to the young blood, I'm going to ask Dr. Satipriya Dasarka. Sir, you've been working along with medical and surgical gastroenterology colleagues. If you can sum up in one minute, what is the best way to have a very, very synchronized or I would say a combined work without taking competition or intrusion into their privacy as a model? Please unmute yourself, sir. Thank you, Kanagwil. Uh, in uh, one of the medical institute in GD, I'm the head of the department of gastro. We have one DNB gastro, we have two DM gastro. In uh, Nightingale, I'm the again head of the department, we have two DM gastros. Uh, we never have any problem and whenever they are going to do anything, they always ask me, sir, you be present if any problem. And also as I'm little more experienced than them, doing more than one lakh endoscopies by this time, so I can guide them. One more thing, I was elected as president of the Gastro Association in West Bengal as a surgeon, where 95% were DMs and physicians. So I feel there is absolutely no uh, competition. I learned everything from them. So many gastro medicine, the theory of gastro medicine, not only the endoscopy, we don't know the diseases, how you can do the perfect uh, diagnosis and give whatever GV was saying, saying all the relevant points. So it's a perfect homogeneous staying with them. I'm grateful to all my gastro friends and AIG has actually inspired me to work with them. One more, just a point, adding to Dr. Khanna, with my contemporary boys who have made DM even from AIMS or Chandigarh, I've seen them learning ERCP and all therapeutics along with me. So nobody has learned or perfected during their training course. Those are the papers. Even I should say, the good technicians actually helped us a lot. Even those DMs will learn many of the tricks from the good technicians. So now IAGS is giving much more methodical way so we can have a very great future. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, sir. Now, before moving to Secretary and President, sir, for closing comment, I'd like to ask Joy. In fact, we had a long talk yesterday and day before how to go about it. In fact, uh, I have been trained in uh, by Professor Chandramohan, where Dr. G. V. Rao got trained in the same department. In fact, they have pioneered combined OP for medical and surgical gastroenterology. In fact, that minimizes so much of time. As Dr. G. V. Sir said, Madras Medical College has pioneered this work of medical and surgical gastroenterology OP together. So the waiting time comes down, no cross-referral times, immediate uh, decisions are made, and combined OPs are held. But in spite of that, I do have my own passion of doing endoscopy for my own foregut patient, especially when I do a colon pull-up or a gastric pull-up. The neck dilatation still I don't give to medical gastroenterologists because I know the way I have done the anastomosis. So everybody has their own passion. So with that on record, now I'm going to ask Joy, propose three important changes you, have, you would like to make in making situation a better way. The first and foremost, I first believe that the seeds have to be sown. If you train them, then only they will do. So a structured program has to be there in the general surgery program, which has to be elevated to the next level. Once, the, once they like, have a liking for GI surgery, they can come on to GI surgery and then learn the advanced procedures. So that is the first and foremost thing which I would like to inculcate that. Inculcate into the syllabus. Unless you inculcate into the syllabus, nothing is going to change, sir. It will be just people haphazardly training. So training, in, it's, it is important. Then the finer points can be corrected by like IAGS having a, a three-month course and all those things. Sir. My strong belief is that, sir, I see the future for... Any procedure is, there will be two clear-cut divisions. 
one will be a non interventionist and one will be an interventionist absolutely so, right yeah so that is my future totally agree. you cannot have people doing half half the measures like uh, my residents keep asking me sir sir we sent the ercp to the medical gastroenterologist i feel like i shave the beard then take the mustache to another person so i believe it should be very clear i don't say that medical gastroenterologist should not be doing but as sir said people who have good hand eye coordination people who know the subject it is not a purely technician's job it is an extremely advanced science you know the basics of disease then you take the techniques of it that is the way to go in the future and we should be working in that, that direction only like hpb surgeons do a lot of hpb work focusing on the diagnostics also just not that your technician that uh, a, 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 a disease is diagnosed and sent to you and you are supposed to just take it out no i don't think that's absolutely i i was trained under dr rajan saxena also he would like like once even if a gall bladder is there we had our small sonography show me the stone the, the one which you've done on the sonograph which you have done not the radiologist so even for malignancies you put in a scope but over a period of time things have died sir at most places at most reputed places so we need to bring it back we need to bring it back so first is syllabus then advanced procedures by societies so these are the things i would uh, and the new coming generation should look into the future this way because what we do what is relevant for the times if we don't stand by that we will be obliterated we will not be there the times always the times have to be noted thank you sir that's all thank you dr jai in fact it is very very prudent that you should swim swim along the waves and keep reaching your destination issue sir no things have boiled down to three important things there should be restructuring for ms training and uh, dnb training number one that's what is the bullets i would like to share with you number two training is not going to end with ms or dnb or mch training is ongoing gv sir has pointed out there should be a someone who is doing endosono someone doing poem that type of specialization has come in and there should be recertification which you have very clearly pointed out will you please highlight the focus of iags for another 5 years or so what we could address to all three things one is regularizing the syllabus number two minimum mandate number three recertification and in fact the most important pertinent thing which has now creeped in as single theme super specialized endoscopy courses what is your take on it sir before we move on to president sir for closing comments thank you kanai well i think before i go into my answering i have to really admire your uh, uh, skill of moderating this session so well done yourself kanagavel and uh, joy the three hours looked like 30 minutes to me i don't know how others feel i think on pick up of all the moderators i think it is very wonderfully crafted program with the questions uh, with the sensitive questions with the, all the people i think uh, we are going with uh, a happy note that is the main thing i want to address and i want to request everybody all every surgeon watching this program go with this idea you surgeons there you have to take endoscopy not an optional skill but essential skill for everyday surgical practice and you have to keep updating yourself you don't update then you become outdated in a matter of few weeks or few months that's the second thing third i told already in my slide endoscopy you would have practiced during your postgraduate time it may be a road less traveled by you but there are people like us in iags platform who are there to guide you so you take the challenges of training because opportunities as dr gv rao put it are plenty out there in the endoscopy arena please take it because in my opinion there is no scope for surgeon without a scope be a laparoscope or a flexible endoscopy i think with that note i thank all the panel and i leave the, our president to give the the final note and the closing remarks so over to you sir come in sir to put on record we have now 820 people in medinet and we have 12 faculty on board so 840 is better than a national conference 
So I hope uh, Govind Raj sir and Ishwar sir's idea of promoting me and Joy as a young ones to run the show. As uh, in fact, I am very happy to announce we have 840 people with us at this moment. So with that word, before uh, moving to President Dr. G, we would like to add something. I could see raising your finger. Sir, please unmute yourself. Sir, please unmute yourself, sir. Yes, sir. I, I, I just shared the same link on my Facebook. Actually, it has got 968 uh, people logged on. Wow. On this side. That is 1,700 people. <laughs> something. I'm, I'm, I'm done for my day, sir. I'm done for my day. <laughs> Do you have any comments before we move on to President, sir? In fact, I'd like to give one final word from Krishna Rao, sir. GV, yes. sir, having boiled down to now competition to collaboration, all of us are agreeing that we have to grow together. No doubt about the challenges here. I'd like to be, give any closing words before I move on to Krishna Rao, sir, and then finally. No, no, I, I, I think we are absolutely right. It is no competition. It is just collaboration. Patient comes first. We come next. I think it is collaboration between us and maybe gastroenterologists and even radiologists right now. Actually, we have a big role right now. Uh, I would like to hear from Professor Krishna Rao what he says. I agree that we have to have the collaboration. But Govindraj would uh, confirm that three years ago when he attended a meeting in Delhi, the medical gastroenterologist wanted to pass a resolution that they will not train the surgeons. But he, after having heard that, he is training physicians under <laughs> him. And that shows the magnanimity of the surgeons in teaching others, even those who are against him. The one word to the young surgeons who are listening to us is that we cannot be expert in everything. We have our limits and level that each one can reach. So let us not say that we will be able to do tomorrow poem or something uh, with the robotics. But we should have our own limit and reach that limit and do it in the exceptional good fashion to the benefit of the patient. Kadraj, uh, you have done an excellent job along with Joy. I've had a long discussion with him also. Some of the points that we raised then, I've not talked about it, but I congratulate you on this exceptionally well-organized uh, meet. Thank you. Thank you, sir. President, sir, we have on record 960 from the Asian uh, Facebook Live, and we have 840 with us. I think IAGS together in such a short notice have made a mark like during COVID era, non-COVID stuff can yield 1,700 plus participation in, I would say 24 hours notice, not more than that. Absolutely. So with that word, I now hand over to you for the closing remarks. Raman sir, please. So, so Kanangvel, uh, first thing is about the webinar. You know, this should silence those people who have been saying that we have a flood of webinars and we should cut down on that because there is a need. This is the need of the hour. People have time and people have an appetite to learn new things. And uh, I believe if we are able to plan our topics to the uh, which interests uh, our the surgeons, uh, we have done for like one, one month, we should be having a good participation and maybe we'll ask Dr. Jeevi Rao to share it always on his Facebook. So now, as far as the points raised during the last 15 minutes of the discussion, let, let me try to clarify a few of them. I, may, I do not agree with some of them and I agree with most of them. First thing is the era of making mistakes is over. When we started doing our first laparoscopic gallbladder, in, I attended first workshop in 1990 and 92, I did the first one. There was nobody to mentor us. And we would take five to six hours to do the first cholecystectomy and second cholecystectomy. Now, lab cholecystectomy. Now, our surgeon, our fellow or a, or a PG, when they do the first gallbladder, they finish the first gallbladder within one hour. So, same thing applies for endoscopy. Dr. Bhaskar mentioned, Gani Bhaskar Rao mentioned about the simulators. Use simulators, get trained and start doing with the procedures that you can, are very comfortable doing. Draw a line where you are not sure what it is. Don't give a report. Sit, tell, talk to the family. I saw it, but I'm not sure. Go to another one and get it done. 
don't start doing varicial bleedings initially you know i remember when i was in mathura i was called it was a third varicial bleed in you know, i was called to do it uh, inject uh, sclerosin there were no bands those days the glue was also not there and uh, my scope got blocked a new scope got blocked and the physician who owned the nursing home said but that's your problem uh, you, you should stop the bleeding and you know they did not have a sang taken tube there and you you felt so helpless and so what i say is that do what you can do comfortably and you are well trained to do and gradually build up as far as joy's observation about being internationalist and non internationalist see the problem is as the association i i see people who are extremely well trained mcs gi surgery and i see a person who is working in a is a small town in a in let's say my my state uttar pradesh and uh, Uh, uh is uh, owning a nursing home and he can't go out of the town for even 10 days at a time uh for to get further trained so we need to educate those people to start doing upper gi scopies or maybe colonoscopy at some stage so short term training programs for practicing surgeons are very helpful because they are very well skilled in in hand eye coordination because of their surgical experience but they don't have time of say more than 3 days to come out and get trained so i think with this digital digital uh, availability of online programs that will make even it even easier for them to attend lectures and then they can come only to the conference national conference to get hands on experience so that is one part and then on the other side what he was alluding joy, uh, joy was alluding was a uh, highly trained people who will be internationalists like how dr gv rao is there so i belong to that generation and the, the the that group which is from a peripheral place got trained and i got a got a break in mumbai so i came to mumbai but i still do don't do anything more than upper gi endoscopy while while there will be people who are mca gi surgery who would like to do ercps and even poem in times to come so i think uh, we need to take as a association association means to associate association means not to disassociate or exclude so uh, my job in this chair is to bring people together and what we have done i'll i'll just uh, in last uh, two, two minutes explain that this year we have started besides this online program uh, association had been giving traveling fellowships so this year we have increased the amount to 1 lakh rupees you can go to any uh, uh, accredited center which could be as a dr khanna mentioned initially we have about 10 training centers all of them also offer endoscopic training so person can spend minimum 6 weeks or more and we 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 give them if they spend 6 weeks we give them 1 lakh rupees traveling fellowship we also have research fellowships if you are publishing and your paper is one of the one among the first five papers in jmas in one year you they get 1 lakh rupee for that publication which is selected by the editorial board so there are there are many things that are happening even for practicing doctors who are not uh, uh, who are publishing a lot let's say dr gv rao you know uh, uh, he doesn't need this but it's a recognition so if you have meaningful publications in any journals not necessarily jmas in a, in a year we are acknowledging those practicing surgeons at the end of the year uh, not by the number of publications there are meaningful publications by recognizing five surgeons in a, in country with 1 lakh rupee each and they will be considered as the best researchers of the year so best publications best researchers of the year and uh, for training traveling fellowships and on top of it we have short term training programs like efiags and faji and fiags for those who are extremely busy and who may not get time to spend let's say 6 months fellowship you, we all know one year fellow training fellowship is ideal how it's done in us i would uh, we also have university accredited bariatric fellows for one year but they are they are young guys who who have time at hand and they they have the zeal to get trained but there are so many senior people who would uh, love to pick up uh, uh, things to to augment their uh, their skills so i think with that uh, i i also wish to put it on record kanagvel and uh, dr joy abraham uh for organizing this program at such a short notice and the entire endoscopy board headed by ashwin masurkar who couldn't join and um, govind raj and dr gani baskar rao are the conveners of that board and uh, dr subhash khanna is our trustee 
and uh, Ishwar uh, uh, pushed everyone. He's pushing everyone to. He has so much energy. Sometimes I wonder uh, when does he sleep. He and Kanagwell never sleep. Uh, they are 24/7. And Dr. Krishna Rao to keep blessed, uh, blessing us to make sure that IAGS grows on the right track. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, President Sir. In fact, I should put on record the efforts taken by Medinet in such a short notice. When Govind Sir and Ishwar Sir requested, they immediately said yes. I should put on record this is done as a service to the IAGS without charges. Thank you, Surinder, and thank you, uh, Bharat, for doing the program. I hope both of you are there. Bharat, in fact, I have been troubling Bharat with at least 10 numbers. Faculty from Bijapur not able to join, faculty from Bagalgot not able to join. Bharat quietly and politely handled everything without even telling a word, sir, I will ensure they are with us. In fact, we had last minute challenges with YouTube because we had to change the password. They could not transmit live. So they promised me, uh, promised us to give the recording. In fact, Facebook Live also could not materialize. But I should thank Mohan and Satin Arena from AAG for giving us the link and sharing the recording which AAG has made. I will be shortly sharing with the IAGS group also. Thank you, Mohan and Satin Arena for uh, Partic volunteering to be part of this recording program. Thank you, Mohan and Sati Narayana. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of IAGS, I thank Dr. G.B. Rao, sir. Dr. Joy, my co-moderator. My mentor, Dr. Krishna Rao, sir. In fact, my short term, I have been uh, leaning on to Dr. Ishwar and Govindraj. In fact, they have been gracious in promoting me in most of the platforms. Thank you, sir, for uh, allowing me to do this. Subhash Khanna, sir, interested with such a big responsibility of becoming an associate editor at such an young age. Thank you, Subhash Kanna, sir. Raman Goyal, sir. I don't know, but maybe one way he's appreciating that we are working 24 by 7. In fact, I'm happy he's challenging us with more responsibilities. In fact, I expected him to do some announcements, but then they are waiting for at the right platform. Mm -hmm. IAGS is venturing into something which never, no societies have ventured in. Inter-society relationships have strengthened. In fact, IAGS Initiated researchers are coming up in a big way. I am sure uh, Raman Goel sir will come up with those announcements at later. Let I leave the privilege to the president to announce those developments. Thank you, Medinet platform. Thank you, uh, AAG, for uh, taking all the time. I thank all my senior colleagues for their time. And in fact, I'm not sure people are still joining. We have 827 participants in Medinet. I bow to the participants of Medinet and to the Asian Facebook Live of 900 plus people, 1,750 for a program of 24-hour notice. We are we are very much honored to host these type of programs in future. Thank you, one and all. With the permission of the faculty, I officially close this program. And uh, Medinet Bharat, I think we can stop transmitting and one by one we will exit. Thank you, one and all, for being with us.